Hey, it's Matt Pinville. It's called In a Lonely Place. It's my show that I named after Humphrey Bogart movie and a smithereen song, who were my friends that I came up with in New Jersey. Because we're all kind of in a lonely place. But, you know, the point is, I mean, we're doing social distancing. We are raising money for Music Cares because there are so many musicians right now who are struggling and going through a lot of different things. I mean, the world has changed so quickly. But the truth is for me that I wanted to do a show and talk about music with my friends who I love and care about because, you know, I mean, it's the thing that has always kept us going besides our families and our friends. So I'm here with a guy that I love so much. I've done podcasts, radio shows with him. And, you know, we were always talking about, we should do a show called The Two Mats. Because <laughs> we talk, we just go off. We talk about records. And I called them and I asked them to do the show because, you know, it just, it was, it felt so natural to me. So I would like to introduce you to uh, uh, one of my favorite drummers ever and one of my greatest friends who has helped me through a lot of, a lot of things in my life. Matt Sorum. Matt, what's up, buddy? How are you, my friend? Yeah, man, I'm good. You know, I'm, just, <laughs> um, I'm dealing with like this weird, you know, I had an operation on my eye right before all the shit went down. So I'm like, it's like my, my, the person who like delivered the food to me, they went, dude, what's wrong? Why do you pink eye? I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, please, I don't want to have to go to a hospital. I'm like, no, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, but uh, to you. I don't think I don't think you look too bad. I mean, you look good. I think. Thank and you, my brother. I appreciate. <laughs> it. Matt, you've been there for me through thick and thin. But the, the truth is, you're one of my favorite drummers, man. And you have been, you know, in, with a bunch of my favorite bands ever. Matt, tell everybody. There's first thing I want to talk about is how you're dealing with this. And you told me about how you realized how this whole thing was affecting musicians right now you like you had this you literally had there there was something you were talking to me about what, what was that well i'm i'm uh you know i've been doing a lot of different projects lately you know entrepreneurial stuff and i got involved in tech and i've been going to a thing called davos the world economic forum and somehow i became the arts ambassador for a thing called the global blockchain council and uh Basically, blockchain is a new data system that, you know, receives data. And so I put up a, uh, a survey for musicians online on my Instagram. You can still go on there and, and check it out. But basically, how are we going to know uh, what's been lost in for revenue with musicians and artists? Because, you know, we all don't have like regular jobs, you know, we're basically self self-employed. We're not, you know a lot on the tax scale, it, gigs come and go. Um, so I think a lot of musicians have said, you know, what's what's the difference? I mean, I'm not working until the summer usually or whatever, but a lot of guys, uh, especially musicians and artists, work paycheck to paycheck, you know, gig to gig. So we did a survey. You can go on the Global Blockchain Business Council or go on my Instagram, Matt Sorum, and fill it out. And that data will be given to the government because if you've seen, you know, people are trying to get some relief and be able to, you know, help with the situation. So we did that. And that's something. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was really interesting. I know we don't, you don't want to dwell on it, but it's so important. Yeah. Because what we're doing right now with Taylor Guitars, Wa Music, Roland, and, uh, you know, we are here with uh, Linda Perry and, and Carrie Brown. You know, I mean, we're just doing what we can do for Music Care. So Music Care helped us out. You, you know, you and I, know those guys very well. We love yep. them, you know, like they're yep. our friends, you know, so, but I want to make this a positive experience. Because, yeah, let's have fun. You know what I mean? Let's have fun. So, <laughs> you and I, all right, yeah. so both our books got delayed. I mean, my book was already out, but it was like, yeah. the paperback was coming out April 4th, and I'm, yeah. and then it's like, out of stock, or we're, you're going to have to wait for it, What you know, whatever. Mine the, got caught book, up in the same like, thing. I've been, my, I've been waiting for your book yeah, they hit the streets for so long because yeah, people have been quoting stuff from our old interviews. Yeah, I mean, shit that you 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 you've been through. 
But well, yeah, when we talked, I think almost two years ago, I'd started on the book and uh, it's been a real cathartic situation for me, but I've also edited it for about three years <laughs> yeah. and it, it was supposed to drop actually last week, April 7th. And I was going to fly to New York and do the Seth Meyers show and be the guest drummer. You know, have you seen Seth Meyers? Yeah, I love Seth. Yeah, They've yeah. got all these guest drummers. So <laughs> I've done it before. Chad Smith's done it. You know, uh, yeah. Brad oh, Wilk, all the drummers, Josh oh. Free. All these guys get up and we play with the band. And yeah. so I was supposed to go to New York. I was going to be in New York this week promoting my book. And then I was going to do a whole book tour. And we were just like, well, <laughs> that's not going to happen. So uh, we, we pushed the book back and it's looking like either late summer, or early fall. We're still kind of waiting to the see. Find out, right? You know, Almost like the light. But here, here's the cover. This is actually not the final. It's going to be hard, hard copy, bigger book but and then right. double talk and jive is so cool it's and look it, it's I'm, not, holding, I'm holding drumsticks so you, people know i'm a drummer because it's different hairdo maybe than the guns and roses era yeah hey listen, <laughs> there's drummer, a drummer and guns yeah Velvet yeah. revolver the cult you know your new band yeah everything you've done like you know and, and you know kings of cast all the stuff that you've done but let's talk i mean that story about you and Tori Amos in the <laughs> hell, okay, is so fucking cool because yeah, I know I remember when I was moving back from LA to New York and I got my baby in the hotel and I know that's the same hotel that you, that you uh, where you guys met and you know Tori Amos you know obviously like means a lot to so many people like you. Tell me about that story. Well, look at this right here. It's for the big Tori fans out there. She's got her own chapter. Oh, it's awesome. So what, what happens is we're talking mid eighties, right? So yeah, we're going to get into the early eighties of Hollywood and, and music and everything in a minute when we start talking vinyl. But basically I met, I met Tori. I was in a top 40 band and I used to play down at the airport and Tori Amos would play in the middle of the lobby on a piano on a grand piano. And you'd walk in a, you know, get your yeah. key to the room and there's Tori Amos. And in those days, obviously she was unknown. And I remember I had a break. We would do 45 minute sets playing like everything from, you know, working for the weekend to, you know, uh, everyone's yeah. going to rule the world, you know, all the yeah. hits of the yeah. time. Right. And I remember walking out on my break and walking up to Tori and saying, hi, who are you? She was playing bad company by the band bad company. Which is bad company. <laughs> I can imagine her singing it, which is actually almost, it's cool, but it's very cool, actually. I love, Have you heard a version? Life. Have you heard a version? No. So, at that it time, hurt, you I heard remember everything else, that like Strange Little Girls album, which is the coolest thing when she did yeah. the whole, I'll switch the male female thing. It was badass, but. So it was the mid 80s, right? A lot of people were in, like, obviously, New Wave was there, it appeared, but there was also Kate Bush. Uh, Peter Gabriel, oh. you know, uh, there was a lot of other music that I was into at the time. I mean, those Kate Bush albums were great, right? And in Kate yeah. Bush, Towns of Love, man, like running up that hill. and Colorado. Yeah, I was into bands like Ultravox, you know, yeah. uh, the Vienna album. That's one of my favorite. Music, Roxy Music, uh, which actually came out of the 70s, but you know. Yeah. So all that music was still influencing me, and rock and roll was kind of not really there in in Hollywood at that time it new wave had taken over and it was pre the mid eighties when, you know, Motley Crue and guns and roses and all those bands came emerged from the sunset strip. So there's Tori. I walked up to her and we connected on Kate talking about Kate Bush. And, uh, and I said, well, what are you doing? And she, you know, she said, well, I don't have a band or anything. I said, so we started a band long story short. We, we, we had a band called Why Can't Tori Read. Oh, yeah. oh sorry, I missed it. Yeah, I, I we, we we got signed by Atlantic Records, and um, basically Jason Flom signed Tori, and the band got let go. But I ended up playing on the record. The record didn't do well, so they shelved the album, and then she made a record called Little Earthquakes. Great album, yeah. And I went on to to go join the Cult a few years later, and then Rock sort of came back into the forte. Everyone was growing their hair out again. And, you know, but 
if you look back at the photo of me, which is in the book, yeah. you know, we were, everyone was doing like the hairdo was more flock of seagulls meets, you yeah. know, Duran Duran. You yeah. Know? I don't know, I know. I, I never had any hair after like I was like 20. <laughs> so, it, so it was so funny because I never had to change my style. But I but I see the changes, but it was yeah. cool. You know, the amazing thing was you look at what you did with the cult and those and those records, which are so great. Well, and I got a lot, I got a lot of cult stuff in here. You know, the book, obviously, you know, Guns N' Roses has probably been the thing that's brought me the most recognition, I guess, right? So yeah, of course. you line people up and say, hey, do you ever heard of the cult? Have you heard of, you know, this band, that band? They would probably say, oh, they heard of Guns N' Roses. But so basically the book goes through all my stories of all the bands I've been in from when I first came to Hollywood in the late 70s, you know, and I'm walking the Sunset Strip in 79, you know, playing. There was a club on Sunset called the Central Club, which before that was filled with McNasty's. And then it became... The Viper Room. Now, no shit. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so on Tuesday nights, every Tuesday night at the Viper Room or the Central Club, yeah. they have what was called Jam Night. So here I am, a 19 year old kid, and I go in there and sign up on the sheet to play, to jam. And yeah. in my book, I talk about being in that club with John Belushi, uh, Robin Williams. I met Angie Bowie there. Uh, we were in the basement where now the bar is in the Viper Room. It used to be just the basement where they held beer and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And in the book, we I tell some stories about going in the basement with Robin yeah. Williams and, and John Belushi. Yeah. And uh, so all, all those, all those characters, days, right? I'm not sure, man, guys. And all those characters were there, man. And that's a good part of the book. You know, coming up in Hollywood um, in those days and then breaking in, right? Trying to get yeah. a gig. And so you were a kid, man. You were like, you know, you, you were like, yeah. like you know what I mean? Like, you know. Well, I, I, I got my first gig at the Central Club, and I was playing with a guitar player named Greg Wright, who went on to play with Michael Jackson, and he was an amazing guitar player. And I finally got up to play at like 145 in the in the morning, last call. You know, remember last remember how call? weird those yeah. those nights were like when the clubs yeah. in the eighties, like yeah. every headline the headliners came out at two, and you're like, what? Yeah. So anyway, I got up at 145 and I this guitar player, Greg Wright, said, hey, man, you're pretty good. And we lost our drummer. Do you want to go on tour? So I said, how much? He said, you know, basically, I, I was already a negotiator. But uh, I said, he said, I can give you 200 bucks a week. And I said, man, I thought I'd won the lottery, you know. And I, yeah. I, in the book, I travel off to the deep south. So I end up I end up going through Texas, Louisiana. And here I am, a 19-year-old kid. And, uh, and Greg was an African-American guitar player. So we run into some problems based on race and, and things like that. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty interesting stuff. You got to remember it's the late seventies and it's like green book stuff still. And almost Motown back in like when they were doing the first. Well, yeah, man. Cause we went through Mississippi. We lived in Baton Rouge. He took me down into new Orleans. I, I, I got really steeped in like, you know, the meters and all that music early on. And my, you know, it, it was a lot of culture for me as a kid taking that in and you know, then I started working with a producer named Michael Lloyd, and I played with people like King Solomon Burke, and uh, uh, I did uh, Belinda Carlisle's first solo record. Weird stuff, just it's cool, but, right? I mean, uh, Gladys Knight. I played with Glass Knight and the Pips. <laughs> I was like, what? It's, it's, but, it's, it's the thing yeah. that yeah, makes it all about like oh, an all-encompassing love for music. Well, I was just here. I was a kid just trying to navigate how to be able to not have a real job. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I love playing drums. That's all I wanted to do. And I didn't care who it was with. So lucky for me, I, I studied my craft in all different areas. I just took the challenge. And then when the cult came along, that was my big break, obviously. And that's when I got, you know, in arenas and in my first tour bus and traveling and, became a member of the band and picked in the photo and, and obviously that trans, you know, that there's a lot of great stories in that book about them taking me to England. And, you know, I start meeting characters like Zach Wild and when he's with Ozzy and yeah, there's all kinds of shenanigans, you know? Yeah. And well, yeah, we have many shenanigans. Don't we? Our late dear friend, <laughs> Randy Castillo and yeah. uh, the original drummer of, of Ozzy. And, yeah. you know, so, there's yeah. a lot of fun stuff like that. And then, uh, 
you know, stuff we get into and, and typical rock and roll shenanigans, I guess. Yeah. Lars Ulrich gave me a really good quote on the book and basically. What did Lars say? What did Lars say in the book? Uh, uh, it's not on this copy, but I got, you know, I got it's great a galley, quotes. Right? It's a galley. So I, uh, yeah, sorry. Joe Perry did one for me. One Billy, you get you know, Billy me. Idol, I tried to get into audition for Billy Idol and his manager said, what have you done, kid? Have you have you been in any bends? And I'm like, uh, well, not big, but that's why I'm auditioning. So yeah. years later, you know, here I am playing with Billy Idol. I've done a bunch of gigs with him and Jay Leno. He's and even some man doing and I said, hey, man, man, Billy, I've always wanted to tell you this, but I wanted to get in your band in 1985. And your, <laughs> man your manager blew me off. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's great. You know? <laughs> And I, I think it's tough for any musician. How do you get from point A to point B? Well, it's the catch 22. Like, what is your experience? And then, um, you know what I mean? And you know what I'm talking about? It's yeah, I mean, you know, people ask me my opinion of what, you know, no. nowadays, I, nowadays I couldn't tell you. But in those days, you got to remember, it's before all this shenanigans in the internet. Yeah. You had to walk up to a club, meet somebody. That's what we did. I mean, you truthfully, I mean, that was the thing. I mean, trying to be getting, you know, like, you know, trying to get into radio and, you know, going from college radio to a commercial radio station, when you're close to the New York market, number one market in the world, how hard that was to just break in. And then eventually I did, but yeah. MTV was a big part of it. But I understand for musicians, it's, we, I mean, it's always about the thing, but it's, it's about being driven, right? I mean, you were driven. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, it's a work ethic. I mean, I think a lot of people look at what we do as sort of, you know, whoo, it just appeared magically, but oh you know, no, I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. but uh, in the book, it tells the story and the struggles and, and then even when you get successful, the struggle, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, oh, once yeah, you're yeah. In the bit, once you're in the business. So I, I go into that a lot and, you know, I, I, I really, uh, I really went through a process writing it, you know, which is very cathartic, but it gives you an understanding of, what part you had in maybe the turns and the trials and tribulations of how your career went. Right. Yeah. And, and we, you know, we make decisions, which sometimes, you know, I mean, sometimes they're, they're literally off the cuff, but they're also, yeah. I mean, they can have, they have a major effect on, on everything, you know, and we, but, but the, the important thing is to just, you know, yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's like, you know, what I try to do in the book is tell the truth my 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 perspective of the story but at the same time going and saying hey you know wow I, well how would i do that now i mean we all grow through a process and oh yeah you know you don't <laughs> especially yeah. back especially back in the day when there was uh, yeah other influences 90s? oh yeah like, you know <laughs> 80s 90s man oh, yeah i That's always say to people people say oh man you must have spent a lot of money doing drugs and blah 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 blah, blah. and i said uh, uh, it's not the money that I spent, but it's the shit I screwed up. <laughs> it's like, yeah. hey, I relate completely. You know, it's the it's decisions, the decisions you make. Yeah. And I made some bad ones. You know what yeah, I mean? We both did. We both yeah. did. But you, hey, you know, but I'm, we're both alive and I'm here. And yeah. We're here, man. And you know, and we're yeah. still carrying the friendship, the message, and our love yeah. for what we do and doing what we do, you know? And, and that's the amazing thing. So when I watch you play drums and the love and support you gave me when I was struggling. Of was course. Un you always you were like the first or second call when you well, you're a mat. You're a mat, man. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> I love you, man. I love you for that, man. You yeah. carried me through a lot of shit. Yeah, man. You know what? But at the same time, I love that because we're both here. And I think what we bring is a great message of hope and our love of music and that you can turn things around. Oh man. And you know, that's, that's the hardest thing right now for the world. It's like, when is the music coming back? Right? Yeah, man. I let me tell you, it's yeah. hard, Matt, because I want to go to the fucking gym. Yeah. I want to go work out. Yeah. I want to go see a live show. I mean, I, was, I mean, or go to a, a meeting, you know, like I want to see my, well, you know, I mean, this is the craziest stuff we've ever had to do, but I think out of this, we're going to be stronger, better, ever, better, right? better for it. And, yeah. You know, I've been here at my pad. I got, luckily I got the vinyl. We'll get into that in a minute. Yeah, but we will. Absolutely. Going back and listening to a bunch of great records. And luckily I, I'm very grateful that I'm able to be in a position that I am that 
you know, there's a lot of guys out there, a lot of women and people that are having a lot more struggles than us. So, yeah, um, I always remember that. I, I, I'm Brad, trying to make the best of it. And, and I'm calling Brad, a lot of people. I'm calling a lot of friends. I had a great conversation yesterday with my my old record executive pal, Clive Davis. Yeah. And I'm out here in Palm Springs. I'm in the desert, which yeah. is great. You know, I have a house in L.A., but I'm out here and there's sunshine and vitamin D and we're able to at least walk around. There's no one in the neighborhood at all. Yeah. And uh, like I got on the phone with Clive. Yeah. And and we 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 talked and and uh, for a while because we've got people have a little bit more time. And then it feels like there's more gratitude for what we've had in our life. Right? Yeah, and like absolutely. What man. we've been allowed to do. And we had this amazing conversation about what he did for Velvet Revolver. And we made this album, the the contraband record, Clive Davis signed us. And here I am, you know, if if business is as usual, it's hard to get a hold of Clive, you know? It's yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Now I got the guy's ear for like an hour, you yeah. know? And I'm like, I'm like, we're just chucking and jibing with ideas. And he's like, well, we could do an online concert. And I'm like, of course we could, let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know? But it's not the same as the energy you feel when you're in that audience, right? Oh, or, you're, or you're on stage playing. Like I've always told people, I, it's, they're like, what is it like to be on stage in front of 100,000 people? And I say, the only way I can describe it is the amount of energy. You got to remember, all those eyes are on you. So that capsulated with love, the love of your band, the love of your music is throwing this intense energy into you. Yeah. That is no other description that I can tell except for that it's intense. And yeah. And you go off stage and you're like, oh my God, I want more of that. That felt so incredible. And um, that's that's the that thing, that bond of music internationally, right? I talk to kids on my Instagram from Italy. I have a lot of fans in yeah, Italy. Yeah, I was with you for one show, Bologna, Italy. Yeah. I was on tour with a band I signed Co Coed in Cambria. Yeah. And they were on a festival with you guys. And we were hanging out with you guys that day. I mean, Revolver. I Double yeah, Bobber Bobber. Bobber. yeah. When you guys was played. that when Oasis played too, right? Maybe. Yes, yes. Yeah, it was. And you know, I love those guys. I mean, you know, I love those those records. I, there's a great story from that. Remember that night we were at the hotel? In yeah. Well, no, tell me, tell it, uh, if you want to tell. <laughs> like it's okay. Well, that's not in the book because we ran out of room. <laughs> but tell the story, man. So we go. Okay, so Velvet Revolver. We play this massive Italian festival, and yeah. Billy Idol, Oasis. Coheed and Cambria, uh, Velvet Revolver. And I remember Zach Starkey was on drums with Oasis, remember? Yeah, it was so great. Well, you know, you and I have talked to Ringo, Richard, about it. Yeah. 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 And we all end up back at the hotel. We're all in the same hotel, right? In yeah. the lobby. And people were playing the piano and we're all drinking. And I was drinking in those days again. I, yeah. I started drinking pretty good again. Anyway. Yeah. I get it. I'm, I'm standing there and I'm talking to... Uh, to Zach and, and Noel Gallagher. And they're standing there. And I got a drink. I got a vodka cranberry. It's about that much vodka and about that much cranberry. <laughs> Keith Richards style. And yeah. I remember I'm standing there and all of a sudden the bottom of the glass just falls out. And Noel Gallagher had a white suit and the, cran <laughs> the cranberry juice just went like boosh, all over his front. Right? <laughs> and I went like, ah. And Sorry, Noel. Oh. I remember, I remember looking over. I remember looking over, and my my wife at the time she was my girlfriend, Ace Billy Idol was sucking on her toes, <laughs> and I went, "Hey, Billy!" Right? I, I yeah, like, right. I was like, "Hey," you know. Yeah. So I I grabbed my wife. Check this out. Ten years later, I'm playing with the Hollywood Vampires. We're getting ready to go to Rock and Rio. Zach Starkey comes, we do double drums. We have two drum sets. The great Zach Starkey, he's the son of Ringo. He plays in a band called The Who for you. That yeah, and Oasis, as we so said. He's yeah, been in the Who for he's been in the Who for 20 years. Exactly. So he's standing there and I'm telling him the story. I go, Zach, do you remember when we were in Milan, Italy, and I spilled that drink all over Noel Gallagher? He goes, mate, it wasn't Noel. It was me you spilled the drink on. <laughs> Oh my God. Man. That's how drunk I was. I was like, oh, sorry. I was like, yeah. 10 years. 
<laughs> for 10 years, I thought it was Noel Gallagher. Yeah. Zach knows. Now, I was, isn't Zach I was wearing the white guy suit. ever, man. Isn't, isn't yeah. Zach amazing, though? What a great guy. He was a drummer. Yeah. Well, guy, like when he took over in The Who, he was yeah. the first drummer who could actually play those Keith Moon parts. Which, well, the, the story goes, Keith was his babysitter, right? Ringo. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, Ringo, Ringo and Keith were really good buddies. And who would leave your kid with Keith Moon? It's like, that's kind of scary. <laughs> it's like, yeah. well, so, yeah. so Ringo was like, knew that Zach wanted to play drums. And so, you know, he had Ringo had the Ringo kit, like one Tom. Yeah. Like, and you know, the story you're going to say is Richard told me that Ringo, because okay. I never knew that the yeah. the myth that Keith put on his first drum set that 35 minutes earlier, Ringo had one delivered. There was a small kit and then the truck showed up with the That's right. big, like who kit. In, in <laughs> typical Keith Moon style. I yeah. Like, that might over the up, top, like, man, right? You know, 20 Tom Toms are gone, yeah. you know, you know, yeah. timpanies. Yeah. Right. Brilliant. Yeah. And after that, Ringo said, you know, he looked at, at Zach and Zach idolized yeah. Keith. Zach yeah. idolized Keith Keith Moon. So yeah. he, in my opinion, the closest thing I've ever heard to Keith Moon. I and, agree, hundred percent. But I also I say, say this, I say this Ringo, about Jason Bonham too. I say about Jason Bonham. I said, yeah, Well, first of all, John Bonham's your father. Yes. So it's an hereditary thing to have a feel. That comes from your heart. Your heart is a Bonham heart. So he's the closest thing I've heard. And so the coolest thing about Zach, I'll tell one more quick story, but that was great. So when they did Desert Trip out here, which is about 20 minutes from me out here in Coachella Valley, yeah. where they have the Coachella Fest Festival, they had Desert um, Desert Trip. Yeah. Which was what we called Ocella, I guess. <laughs> Ocella, yeah, exactly. I know. So I, I, you know, I want to I go to the gig. I call a few friends. I'm like, tickets were like 1500 bucks or something. And it's not like, but it's weird when you're in a band and you're going to go buy a ticket. It's, it's, so you know who texts me and says, hey, man, come to the show? Zach Starkey. That's, that's so cool. Who man. invites you to a show? Like, not a lot of people do that. Yeah. Brian May invited me to see Queen at the Hollywood Bowl and Wilson. Every once in a while, I'll get like, hey, please come. But when you're in L.A., it's everybody's calling you. And yeah, so and, you know, it's weird. It's I go I go to I go to the festival with my wife, Ace. And we we have a parking pass and we drive in. And we're going in the back and all of a sudden we pull up and we're right behind the stage. And I remember going, Zach, this is like beyond vip i feel like i'm in the band <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you know that feeling oh you absolutely and he's such a great guy you know and i'm he's still a fan of, i'm still such a huge fan i'm like fanboy right i'm like, i love him yeah and the who are so important to me as you know man you know, i love i love them but you you know when you were talking about the other people that were uh you know th that you loved in those shows that you saw you said you know, Ann Wilson and Hart. What was the other band that you mentioned? Because it was some. Oh, Brian oh, May. Brian. The greatest thing in the world for me was seeing Queen Night at the Opera in 1976. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, 11 or 10. Oh. And I'm in the, I'm all in the nosebleeds, like maybe yeah. all the way yeah, back. Well, there's a good part in the book in here, uh, Freddie Mercury tribute. And I got a whole chapter on How was that. Oh my God, I gotta ask you about that because in you know, before that was before I was on MTV. So when I was on MTV and they found out I was a huge Queen fan, they hired me to write the liner notes. Brian May hired me to write the liner notes to the Crown Jewels, that CD box set when yeah. Hollywood writes from Electra yeah. after EMI. And that was like an honor beyond belief. You know, it was uh, to write about this band I loved. And you know, I saw a show where it was the first four albums. And then I saw a year later them and Thin Lizzy with Day of the Races. And it was just fucking, you know, I mean, <laughs> once you've seen Queen, you know, with Freddie at that, any of those periods of time, it was amazing. Oh, man, man. Well, check it out. So the Freddie oh. Mercury tribute. So it, we played. We, so, so, like, you know, my thing is cool, but your thing is cooler. <laughs> well, but I love you for being. Tell me about it, because I, I I once got locked in a bathroom with David Lee Roth at Charlie Sheen's house, and we tried to outdo each other on stories. David really? Lee Roth won. David Lee Roth won. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
not to update, not to, uh, but so there's a whole chapter on the Freddie Mercury tribute. I got to tell you why. Well, when Freddie passed away, you know, obviously Queen was in that, at that particular time, Brian and Roger and John Deacon, they were like, oh, we can't continue without Freddie. Well, they had never thought, how can you do that? Right. So they threw this massive concert at Wembley Stadium, 72,000 seat, the original Wembley. And we opened the show with Metallica, Def Leppard, and Bowie was there too, right? Like uh, Bowie got up and did Ian it. Hunter, Mick Ronson, every right, right, you know? Mick Ronson, Ian Hunter, Robert Plant, Annie Lennox, right? Like everybody, Annie had- Lennox and 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 Bowie did Under Pressure. Yeah, so everyone sang a song. Axel and Elton did Bohemian Rhapsody. So genius, right? Watch it on YouTube. It's yeah. incredible. That- you and, know, actually, uh, so Slash did amazing. Tie Your Mother Down. You yeah. Know, everyone got up and guessed it after yeah. that. Um, yeah. And backstage was just mayhem. So I tell all those stories uh, about rubbing elbows with Elizabeth Taylor <laughs> and and Liza Minnelli. I was, I partied with her all night. <laughs> That's yeah. Yeah. It's great. It was so yeah, fun, man. And because I, I look back, so, I'm like, I, I, this book I'm, you know we talked about it even before it came out you and i you know we were doing like a, a radio show uh you know it was a podcast but radio show that was on like you know maybe 30 yeah. st- stations in america yeah we were doing this thing and we were talking about the story about you smuggling cocaine and almost not even realizing what you're doing well i mean you yeah, know my, that's what, in the book i yeah. you know I mean, you don't, we don't have to go into it because I think we'll get. Well, into- I, I was, you know, I was, I was in a rough spot. You know, I was here. I was a musician. I got, I got offered this gig with this guy. He had a band, but it ended up being he is he, you know, how he paid for the band. It's in the book. It talks about he paid us all a salary, and then we're like, how's this guy getting money? He has driving a nice car, and he's got, yeah. nice, but he doesn't work. He's in a band, and yeah, in the 80s, and he, right? Anyway, like- I fall into this whole thing, and I end up you know, getting paid to go do this crazy stuff, um, smuggling. And, you know, I look back in retrospect, I'm not proud of it, except I have to tell it. At the same time, it's it's an incredible story. It's like, and then I, I, I literally, I'm in a situation where I'm like, man, this is dangerous. I'm going to, I'm going to either a guy that takes my place ends up going to jail for 20 years. And I get out at, in the nick of time. And I end up getting a call right at that time from a drummer named Pat Torpy was Mr. Big's drummer. Yeah. And all these people were calling me going, hey man, there's this band looking for a drummer. The Cult. Yeah. And you got to remember, now I'm like 28 years old. I'm starting to like, you know, in those days as a rock and roll musician, you're like, 28, that guy's old. You know, you're (laughs) like, you're like. We I laugh about that now. I mean, it's just so Right? Yeah, right. I'm like, I'm done. I'm, am I going to make it? So I get this call right in the nick of time. And I literally, I literally take off from this situation I was in in Long Beach, and I head back to Hollywood, and I go and audition, and that's all in the book. And that starts the cult era where I audition for Billy Duffy, and, and yeah, and, and you know, and you obviously, you, me, and Billy, and fucking Ian, we were for <laughs> a long fucking time, and I, love, you know, so we- I end up, I end up in that band, and that was like a save, you know, I, I'm like, okay, my my dream has come true. Now I'm in a band, I'm on the road. Uh, our first show, we we start touring with uh, Metallica during the Justice for All era. Yeah, great album. And, and we go on this huge tour with Metallica for six months. And I meet Lars. So there's a whole. Ch- <laughs> I told Lars, I go, Lars, you got your own chapter, brother. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah, exactly. I got Lars in here. I showed too. But uh, just so much fun. I mean, like I said, oh yeah, here it is. Yeah. Oh, I gotta see that, man. You know. Yeah, Lars. I love Lars. And, and Lars gave me a great, great quote. We're still good friends. And um, he's just a rockhead like us. He loves the he loves the music. You know, well, he's, he's a music lover and he's a smart guy. You know, he's just a great person. And and so anyway, he uh, he you know I talk about him. He kind of shows me the ropes a little bit. He kind of he was a great guy. He was always so warm, and I love him for that. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, I mean, your 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 thing was so, obviously so different from mine. But it was, you know, when I started doing MTV, they were, you know, Lars goes, "Dude, we should be hanging. We should be friends. We should hang. You look, you love rock." So well, the, you got to remember how he got Metallica together was he was a music lover. You know, he liked he was he had he ran the Motorhead fan club. Yeah, he was like in the second wave of heavy metal, like you know, like the the British yeah. second wave, right? That's and right. 
or even punk. Those guys, I listen to Anti Nowhere League covering yeah. Killing Joke, yeah, <laughs> which I loved. You know, great yeah, band. And, and, and the I energy, in the, the energy in that tour in '89, Justice for All, you know, was so intense. And I look back that with such pride that I was be able to be in that era, you know, of of that yeah. great touring. And you know, there are bands are out doing it still and stuff. And you know. Um, Metallica is still out there kicking ass, and yeah. I went to see him last time. I went to see him was when they did the last this last stadium tour, and I yeah. was in Philadelphia. I took the train from New York to Philadelphia, yeah. and I got off the you train. Might, go, it's never enough. It's never an, a problem yeah. to make the effort to see Metallica live. Oh, it's fucking it's still so powerful! You know I, mean? I love the it. guy that runs sound out front. His name's Big Mick. Yeah, he, I, you know what. Beard and he's gray hair. He looks like he, had, you know, from the countryside of England, like he lives yeah. in a cave or something. But it's so loud and just yeah. Like, oh. I love the I love I love it loud. We all <laughs> yeah. do, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. you know, and so and then with being with, and we're going to talk about the record soon. But you know, being and joining Guns and Roses. Talk to me about that moment because you know, you and I got. I mean, you went through stuff that's so historic. Well, you know, it was a really critical time for me career-wise. What was I going to do? Like, I was very, very happy in the cult. You know, they, they, they were really good to me. And it felt, I mean, a lot of people think, ah, that's your band, Matt. That's, that's the, your style, maybe, right? But Guns came along and, and offered me the gig. And, you know, what could I do? They were, at, at that particular time, in 1990, they were the biggest band in the world. Yeah. And, uh and they, were looking, they were looking around for a drummer, you know, and they came to see me. It's in the book, Slash and Duff come to see me uh, at the old Universal Amphitheater. Yeah, so, man. Remember that place? They yeah. tore down. With the, right? <laughs> yeah. Place. We were doing two nights, the cult. We, you know, we were on the Sonic Temple album, so we were pretty big at that time. Yeah, Fire and, One and, uh, and, and all the songs on Fat Record in New York City and everything, right? Oh, yeah. We used to open the show in New York City. Yeah, great song, man. And we had this whole montage with Iggy Pop and yeah super cool. and uh anyway it's in the book where Slash calls me and um the chapter's called uh uh slushes on the phone because yeah. my mom I was I get really sick I get pneumonia on the road with the cold I'm sick and I go home and I'm sleeping at my mom's house and the phone rings and uh, my mom says someone named slushes on the phone <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like what yeah yeah and it's funny because you know this during this pandemic we're reaching out to people we haven't spoken to in a long time right i know i am yeah people we love i i had an amazing conversation with mike clink for about an hour the other day oh did you that's awesome who produced appetite for destruction yeah and he produced megadeth what album i it was it wasn't symphony for destruction it was rust Kells, but who bought who, rust in peace a rust in peace theater, yeah and uh, it was great man, and then he had and, and Michael produced, Barbaro and, and Steve Thompson mixing the records, right? And we, right. he produced Mike produced Use Your Illusion, so we had these yeah. great conversations. But yeah, so here I am. I'm you know, I've got to make these records, these Use Your Illusion yeah. records, and I'm coming out of a, a world tour and I get thrown into this thing, so it's all in the book. I mean, it's 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 pretty detailed. I mean, I feel like uh, somehow I got a little bit of a Rain Man mem memory. I can remember a lot of stuff. You're like me then. Okay, no, because people always, which, yeah, you which I, is, always, you and I always talk about like the fact that we should have done, or maybe one day we'll do a podcast, radio show, something together as the two <laughs> mats because we just go off on like well, everything with the life we've been given, man. We're, right? we're blessed to talk about music all day, right? I mean, I mean it's, come on, it's what we love, it's what we care about. It's yeah, I mean, the world, you know? Wow. I know, and you know, watching you play drums, all you know all these years just uh well and getting to know you as a friend <laughs> who i love and then finding out how much you you love so many records that i loved growing up and yeah you know and when it was you know that's the par parallel life that we love these records so much you know well the culture yeah, and the and culture was deep you know it, it's it's a culture of maybe pop music and you know whatever is happening for kids now and you kind of have to look at Culture and revolution and 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 fashion and everything changes yeah, through time. Yeah, I'm just like you. I mean, that's why Billie Eilish, Young Blood, yeah. you know, Machine Gun Kelly, Grant. Yeah. I love I love all that stuff. We're talking about that kid, Young Blood. 
Oh, yeah, he's going to be on the show uh, in a couple of weeks. That's I right. love him, man. And he, the energy when you're a kid. When yeah. I look at him, I think he's got he's nothing to lose. He doesn't give a shit. It's he's like, so fucking cool. He's such a rock. That's how we were when we were young, man. Now yeah. we got like, oh, God, I got to pay the... I yeah, pay mortgage and, uh, yeah, mortgage. but yeah, yeah. and, and <laughs> yeah, I, you, I know you agree with me, like, you love his energy, man, because he yeah. just he's yeah. the I mean, he's so great, man. Yeah. I'm a big fan, you know. So, let's talk about the records. You know, it's so you know, I hate limiting you to the seven or eight records because it's kind of the format of the show, yeah, but we do it because you know, you're like me, I, yeah, in my book, I had I had to literally. Limit every decade to 50 albums. I'm like, how the fuck do I yeah. do? You know, but I mean, my publisher said, yeah, you got 50 albums, dude. You know, it's only two is it, you know? Well, All right. I can't. Okay. Let me explain one thing before I start. Yeah. So I'm in, I'm in Palm Springs. I have a house here. And if you see, I got a full turntable rig. This is made by VPI. It's like, it's killer. I mean, you could. Oh, it's badass. Yeah. You can make, you know, you can make eggs on this. You can, you know, <laughs> I mean, this yeah. is serious, right? It massages yeah. you. Uh, this is a BPI amplifier. So it's analog. Yeah. And then I have, I have clipped speakers over there. Those are the heresies. Which are amazing. And if and you, you, see and you have pictures of Frank you on your wall. See this? Jonas Ockerland just gave me that. You know, Jonas? Yeah, I know, Jonas. Yeah, I've, you know, I, I took that photograph. That's older Iggy and older Deborah Harry. Yeah, so brilliant, man. Exile on Main Street, the original photography by Jim Marshall. Yeah, more Buddy Rich, and then let name that guy. You know who that is? What? I don't know if I can see it from here. It's oh, uh, who is? Mark, is it? Mark Bolin, T Rex. Oh, you know how much I love him. So I mean, you know, that was the whole thing. You know, with Mark. I was so happy he got the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. How Wilner died, man. He'd been working on that uh, that out that T Rex record, and we were driving around, and I was in Howie Weinberg's mastering studio with Hal. Hal. I've ever put I mean, Howie's the best, dude. We uh, love it. Talk yeah. about gold. Talk yeah. about gold records. So let's talk about uh, Iggy Pop. No, gold records in it. So anyway, go what ahead. I was going to say was, I'm here. I have a lot of, you know, my records that I have in the desert are primarily. I was saying before, Dean Martin, Sam Cooke. Wow, you know, I listen, I listen, when I'm out here, I listen to different stuff. You know, I'm doing... Yeah, because obviously I know you love, like... I know the stuff that you love and listen to, too. Buena Vista Social Club. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. Know, just, just different stuff. So I don't have a lot of rock records here. I keep my rock records in my L.A. studio. But I've got, I think, some interesting records. I can't say and they're my think- favorites, but they're deep records. Yeah, I, I mean, you know the funny thing. Biggie Pop, Lust for Life. Yeah, and I, you know what? Here, it's such a great record. Here's the interesting thing, Matt. I'm gonna let you tell me why you like it. Because here's the thing: you and I can literally probably talk for 40 hours about every record we like. Yeah. But whatever's in front of you, there's there's a reason why it means a lot to you. That, well, let me let me say trauma. something. I'm I'm but working with a company. I have a company now called Experience Vinyl. So I yeah I'm really. I'm really happy that vinyls come back a bit. It's yeah. about 14% of the market share now. People love what I love about vinyl is I'm able to go on the back and read all the credits. Like when we were kids, you know? Yeah. So you're looking at this, you're like oh, totally contact with the artist. We were like, if I read the back of an Aerosmith album or Bowie album or yeah, a rock. Listen, look at this. Lust for life. Co-written yeah. by guess who? David Bowie, of course. Yeah, man. You know, it's fantastic. Okay. The drummer was on Lust for Life. Well, there, there were the Sales Brothers, right? Um, Hunt and Tony. Hunt and Tony, the sons of Soupy, Soupy Sales. Sales. Well, Soupy Sales. Now look at that, man. And one of the most classic drum beats ever for Lust for Life. I think. Yeah. I mean, isn't that a Gene Krupa? Like, boom, 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 it's, boom. Well, yeah, it's a bit it's Gene Sandy Krupa Nelson. boogaloo, but he did it with the kick drum. Boom, yeah. Bam. And you, you as a drummer, know like obviously because Buddy, you mentioned Buddy Rich, and like our mutual friend Matt Cameron, we always talk about how his dad would always play in Buddy Rich. But it's interesting because you, when you listen to the beginning of Ballroom Blitz by Sweet, it's like Sandy Nelson, like that fucking Let There Be Drums, it's harder. You know what I mean? A lot of these drummers from the seventies were into swing music. Yeah, Bill Ward from Black Sabbath, Ian Pace from Deep Purple. 
John Bonham was into Motown. Yeah. These rock drummers took from where that where they came up, how they grew up, right? Yeah. The rock drummers from my era in the 90s, we came up from drummers in the 70s, 80s, right? So we were like, I, I was I, I'm a little older than the 70s. Uh, I mean the 70s. I had some 60s, but you're yeah, my age, man. You but that. yeah, but um, so you kind of just go with what you know. It's like yeah. It's like when kids now are listening to rap music or when they were listening to rap metal, it's because they had rap and they had metal. Now you got Limp Bizkit, you got Linkin Park, you got, you know, they yeah. come from what they know, from the culture. So that's one of my faves. I love this record. Let's go. Let's go to Sticky Fingers. Brilliant record, by the way. Sticky, Sticky Fingers. Fingers. One of the greatest. You know what? That was, you know, that, that thing after Let It Bleed and... Beggar's Banquet. I mean, it was it was this record. It was the first record on their on their label with the tongue, Rolling Stones Records. Yeah, just but the it, most incredible visual. Look at that. Look at that album cover. You can't yeah, get I mean, that and on it had a little square on it in in on the Apple stores, <laughs> right? Like, you know, and it was Andy Warhol. Like, right? He like designed it. Andy Warhol, and then the thing that's cool about now we were talking about the unsung hero. Of this era of Rolling Stones, you got to remember Let It Bleed, Sticky Fingers, yeah. Exile on Main Street. The yeah. guitar player was Mick Besides Taylor, you. man. Mick Taylor was like, he brought them back into their blues era. You know, when Brian right. after Brian Jones passed away, Mick Taylor joined the band. And if you listen to the musicianship and the solos on this record, it's not Keith, it's Mick. And yeah. you're like, wow, it's so deep uh in the blues entrenched in blues but there's so many great songs on this record I mean, uh, you know i mean that record is um you know brown sugar <laughs> we could say this brown sugar would never be a number one record today because of the lyrics right you know <laughs> but i know i mean it's a wild different. horses but wild, wild horses on the other hand yeah. is one of the greatest moments the stones did and the fact that they went to like to tennessee to memphis and they, you know, and they went out there and uh, and did uh, it was it was either Fame or Muscle So Studios, you know, up there with those guys. They had the two studios at that point, I think. That uh, and they went there and recorded that and Brown Sugar there. And they might because have because they heard Aretha Franklin. It's in the Muscle Shoals documentary. Uh, that's is that? Hey, can I just tell you? Is that like one of the greatest music documentaries? I mean, I, I mean, I love a lot of them because I'm a freak right. for music documentaries. Well, well, Aretha goes down there based on our uh, our Armin er Erdogan and and yeah. uh, the the records that they and were making. There's a problem, and well, she goes there because such a great sound's coming out of the studio. But she she gets there and she realizes all the musicians are white. They fit. It was such a soulful thing that they thought yeah. they were all African American guys. It's like in the song "Sweet Home Alabama," in Muscle Shoals, they got the Stompers, right? You know, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's right. So the Stones go down there because they just want vibe. Yeah. And that's the great thing. The Stones, you know, Exile on Main Street, you know, they rented, you know, a mansion in <laughs> France. And, France. Know. Yeah. For tax evasion. Yeah. And <laughs> so look at this. This is the entire collection of every Rolling Stones album. Oh, you mean everything after London, the London period? Every yeah. record. So fucking great. Look. Wow, man, that's actually better than my box. Which is, you know, the Rolling Stones in mono, and if you look behind me, the Bowie first five years is like. Let's is talk about this like record that. for a second. You know what? That's what that is. Blondie's Parallel Lines is just one of the greatest albums ever, man. Because for a million reasons, they were so great as a band. Clem Burke, you and I love him, right? Like oh, Clem, yeah. what a drummer, right? Great think drummer. about Jimmy Destry, uh, Clem. Yeah. Everybody, Nigel Harrison, when they did Heart of Glass. Well, let me tell you why why yeah. they did Heart of Glass. Now, you got to yeah. remember, this is 1978. Yeah. So, Studio 54 opened in 1977. So, Disco yeah. had arrived. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so Disco now seeped into the music language of what's next. And bands got kind of a little bit scared, I guess. So, I'm not saying they wrote yeah, the songs didn't miss you. Even, you know, even though the rest of some girls was like, Oh, oh, right. So this album was done in 78, you know, Studio 54, New York City, uh, you know, steeped in punk. These guys were a punk band. They played CBGBs. Yeah. Now, they created one of the most commercial songs they ever wrote, Heart of Glass. 
Clem yeah. Burke plays this kind of disco beat, danceable, pop brings in the pop sensibilities and becomes a huge hit for them. Yeah. And the funny thing was, it was originally they were trying to do a reggae song. And the producer, Mike Chapman, who yeah. also did uh, Ballroom Blitz, I talked about earlier. Mike right? Chapman did another record for a band. And Pat Benatar, Benatar, right? Yeah. 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 But I, I, Chrysalis Records. What a great label, man. Like, it was so great. Daniel Glass, all the people that worked there. Look at the uh, artwork of that. Black and white. It's so cool. Yeah. And you know what was great on that album, too, was, you know, the famous story, Matt, is that I love the Gun Club, especially Fire Love, the first record. But but uh, Jeffrey Lee Pierce was a kid running around L.A. who lo- was head of the Blondie fan club before yeah. he was doing his, like, you know, death blues, like, Jim Morrison thing. And he handed, and Nigel Harrison told me this at dinner, and it's true. He was running up to their limousine after the Plastic Letters tours, and he goes, you got to hear this band. And it was hanging on a telephone by the nerves from here in L.A. That's a cover. Pierce gave them the cassette, and that's why they recorded it. That's right. They, 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 re- they recorded that song because it was just a great song. And yeah, they- and one way or another, right? I mean, I, you know, Nigel said to me, he goes, yeah, I live in Italy now. He goes, uh, those ketchup commercials are paying for my... Well, yeah. Nigel became a big uh, A&R guy. Over yeah, Columbia. Yeah, yeah. I think it was Columbia. Nigel yeah. Harrison. Maybe and, uh, probably before I, I was probably before I was an A&R guy. Yeah, because he had a good ear, you know, he just did yeah. good songs. And those okay, guys were so fucking cool. Let's go, let's go, Trace Ombres. Let's do it. Oh man. And can we just say how great that new ZZ Top documentary is, man? Yeah, I went I went to the premiere. Um I I know you know that I've been touring with Billy. We have a band called the Big Bad Blues. Yeah, I love Billy, man. We gotta get him on here. I, I'm yeah, sure we will. We made yeah. a record, we made a record called the Big Bad Blues. Check it out, it's really cool. Yeah. It sounds like old ZZ Top because I keep pushing them to go back to this stuff. Yeah. Right? But you, you got to remember when they got into the 80s, then they then came Eliminator, Afterburner. Yeah. And you know what? I wasn't mad at that because the songs still had, they were soulful. And they had oh. to recreate, hey, they had to recreate their sound. They yeah. Had to and I loved it. I, I mean, give me all your love and got me an impression of those songs are fucking great songs. Oh, yeah. They had to, they had to recreate. <laughs> push. And like heard it on the X, beer drinkers and hell raisers and all that shit. Right here, beer drinkers and hell raisers. Uh, I got a really cool story. The world didn't know what to do with them in the beginning. And they were so fucking cool just doing their thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Waiting on the bus, Jesus left Chicago. Hey, hey, waiting on the bus, Jesus left Chicago. I mean, that stuff is, you know, even the Pixies have covered that. Like, I mean, it's everybody, you you know, you got to love this easy top stuff. LaGrange, the big ones on here, LaGrange, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so Bill Ham, Bill Ham was their producer. Yeah, and, and manager, right? You know, yeah, and, and their manager. And when Bill was alive, Bill was wouldn't allow anybody in the band to do an outside project. It was all about ZZ Top. Right? Yeah, stay together. Nobody can do solo band projects. You can't sit in with people. So when Bill passed away, Billy went crazy. He just was like yeah. playing with everybody. He went and played with Clapton. He did, you know, records. And Dusty and Frank were probably cool with it, man. I'm sure they were. I mean, they were doing their own thing, right? Or Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, they've been together 50 years. That band started in 1960. Yeah. So watch the documentary. It's oh, I watched it. And I love those guys, man. It's super, you know what it is? I love a documentary that is honest yeah. from the heart. Like yeah. all the blemishes, everything, man. All right, burn. We... And you got Glenn used to sign it. Who is So I was telling you a second ago, I'm working with this company called Experience Vinyl. Go to experiencevinyl.com. This is, there's a bunch of signed copies from Glenn of the Burn album. Now you got to remember this album, when it came out for me, it was like the Bible. Yes, was, it was the first album with him and David Coverdale, man. That's right. And Coverdale told me, he goes, dude, I was like 18, 19. Fucking yeah. Burn. It was actually and- called Mark Three. this lineup. Not yeah. Mark Two. Three. It might just take your life. And that's, I mean, those songs were mistreated. So yeah. yeah. Uh, I love that record. Mistreated. Yeah. I mean, Burn is like, Burn is the title track is like on fire. It's just when like. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I had a PA like in my yeah. garage and I would play that on full blast. Yeah. I'd play to it, you know. And when I got to the point in my career where I was able to play that song with Glenn Hughes, right? That was like, for me, I always tell this to Glenn. I'm like, bucket list stuff. I'm like, yeah. on. have you seen us do it together? 
Yeah, I have, man. And you know, after, you know, in fact, I saw you do it. Yeah. Probably like two for me, months after I met That's like, for me as a kid, as a, a fan, boy, drummer, kid, growing up with this. And yeah. I play, and now I play with this guy too. It's like, what? You know? Yeah, right. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's that thing where, you know, your life, and all of a sudden you're with, with your heroes, which is yeah. unbelievable. It's, it's great. so great. It's great. It's, why, it's the thing we have to remember, you know, while we're going through these times, that, you know, the blessings and the things that we've had. So yeah. have gratitude, stay strong for our families, and give love. And let's talk about Billy Idol's Rebel Yell. <laughs> Man, you know what? I've got some, yeah, I mean, you, you've got more stories than I do with Billy, probably. But I mean, Steve Stevens. Steve Stevens, what, right. I mean, when he joined with him on the, on the, uh, obviously, obviously the, the first DP, Don't Stop, was like the stuff. I mean, besides Money Money and, and Don't Stop, was Untouchables and Dancing with Myself, which they had done with Tony James and the old Gen X. But that, uh, you know, I, I love the first record too, like Come On, Come On, and obviously White Wedding. But you know what 1980, I mean? 1983. So you got to remember early, man. early New Wave era, but still yeah. danceable because yeah. when I was in Hollywood in the early 80s, there were dance clubs, but they would play bands like Flock of Seagulls and Duran Duran and Kaja Goo Goo and, yeah. you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. And kids would go and they'd do that kind of goofy New Wave dance, right? And there was a club um, called the Cat Club, uh, the Cat House. Yeah. And they would mix... They would mix like this idle stuff, but they would play dance music. That was that era of dance music. It wasn't DJs, right? Yeah. So, so when you listen to Rebel Yell, you know it. Has you know, Blue, Blue Highway is fucking. I love Blue Highway and Do Not Stand in the Shadows. Yeah, I fucking those are love the those deep cuts man. that are really great. Yeah, Blue and I got out of face. You got him. I mean, it's just a beautiful eighties. Plus, 80s plus your fantasy. I mean, so yeah. ahead of its time. Catching my fall, that right. Produced by Keith Forsey, who was like, would have the drummer in those days, they had drum machines, but they'd have the drummer play yeah. like, I believe this was Joan Jett's drummer on this. Tommy, uh, let me see. This is a great thing. You can open this up. Uh, yeah, yeah, Tommy Price, who ended up Tommy becoming Price, yeah. New York drummer. Tommy and his Joan brother. Jett's drummer yeah. to this day. Joan Jett's drummer he played on all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, um, so, great drummer but he could play like you know like yeah. really drum machine kind of hi-hat and just an epic record and i thought i would throw it in there because you know really sam play. hollander who was my guest friday has just produced three new songs with, with uh billy and, and uh steve you know and i um you know i love those old records and i was a big generation x fan actually i mean i love i mean you know oh, yeah. those yeah. records you know you know people don't know matt is that Dance on myself. <laughs> Billy wrote the music, even though he sang it, and Tony James wrote the words. Like it's a total flip around, which right. is pretty crazy, you know. Yeah, I, I, so, Billy Idol was a great frontman, and we used to when I first meet Tony James in the late eighties. Oh uh, yeah, in a, club, in a club in England called the Hippodrome. I remember the Hippodrome. Oh yeah, hey, and, hey and you know what's Matt? Ian Asbury introduces me to him, and he was just such a jerk. <laughs> yeah, well, that's just what i wanted from him he he said uh ian said hey uh tony this is our drummer matt and tony said well is that the best you could do <laughs> <laughs> what a prick even though you know i love him and he, he's typical typical me. british humor but if you know? he was just fucking with you yeah I'll be like, i had a band called neurotic outsiders with steve jones stuff mccain yeah. and john taylor and, and let's just talk about it duran duran sex pistols yeah. right and yeah, we I made mean, a record. We made a record for Maverick. If you can find it, it's a pretty cool record. It's a great it's record, man. It's produced a by, um, oh my god, I'm spacing out the keyboard player from Talking Heads. Um, um, uh, uh, uh Jerry yeah. Harrison, man. Jerry, Jerry Harrison, yeah, yeah Jerry, we went, dude, we went up Jerry really Harrison. Harrison. Talking Heads, who also did the biggest live album, Cop Throwing Copper. Yeah, he did Throwing Copper, and you know, he's involved with uh. Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers and like that oh, early yeah. shit. Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers. Yeah, man. Roll, run, roll, run. run. <laughs> so good, man. Yeah. Well, so, you do this. That's what so, we um, We're music freaks. We real just... quick. So Jerry Harrison does this record. We produce, we make this record for Maverick, which is Madonna's label, for a young A&R guy named Guy O'Siri. Yeah. Now, 
big manager manages you too. Anyway, uh, we make the record and I, I, I go to the whiskey bar, which is at the Sunset Marquee. And I see Johnny Lydon coming at me, right? And I think I was with Duff or Slash or somebody. Was Duff with you probably? Yeah. We're walking through and I go, hey, Johnny, it's Matt. I'm in a band with Steve yeah. Jones. He goes, yeah, tell that wanker to fuck off. <laughs> yeah. you're, like, you know, you're like, what else would you want to get from Johnny Rotten? But right? remember, were you there the night of that punk thing with John Barbados where... Were, were you on that? Like I was, I was there. I was there. Yeah, yeah. Machine Gun Kelly got pissed and said, "Fuck you, to Johnny." It was. <laughs> so, he, he still, hey, he still got it, right? He's you know, yeah, it. I love him. He was nice to me that night, but at the same time, I get it. But I, I got to give Marky, Henry Rollins, and all the other people on the, on that panel so much cred for like just keeping their cool. Well, how about um, the argument between you know, Marky Ramon, Marky Ramon, and the Sex Pistols? Well, Marky, Marky, the, the you know the thing though is here's what I think: Marky, you can't say he wasn't an original Ramon because he played on a, like so many of the great records, and he was the guy that Tommy wanted to take over for him and just be a producer. Marky's fucking great, man, and he's been really good at keeping you know it alive. I I actually yeah, did I a show. It. I did a show with the Colt. And this is, you know, 10 years ago, but yeah, I was in Brazil and we were playing uh, around 20,000 people outside. And you know who the headliner was? Who? Oh. Marky Ramon. Yeah, I mean, this is amazing. And it, the Ramones were massive in South America. Yeah. They were like, yeah. oh, they were the like crazy. almost Iron Maiden level. If you oh, hey, can I just tell you something? So I hosted the broadcast for the rest of the world for Rock and Rio for seven nights this last year. Oh, cool. Uh, there's the, my Iron Maiden. Obviously, I could. Er, people were flying in from all over the world. And oh, even yeah. though, like, I mean, it was everybody. It was Muse, Foo Fighters, Bon Jovi. It was, you know, it was a great lineup. But the funniest thing in the world is a car pulls up in front of my hotel and they're playing the KKK took my baby away by the Ramones blasting out of a car. I was yeah. like, Holy shit, what the yeah. fuck? I just I had no idea why, yeah, but I also... The yeah. best fans in the world, man. The best... You know, and Mar you know what? And, and I have to say Italian fans, if yeah. there's any Italians watching right now, I, I would say the That's Latin the countries the Latin countries are number one. They're steeped in passion. Oh, they're, oh they're I steeped love in culture. It. You know, it, those records were handed down from their parents to the kids, and the kids... Yeah. They, they're younger kids that are into rock and roll. Like, yeah. Like, into Ma Maiden... Yeah. Uh, you know, In the Ramones. I mean, everything. Of course, Guns and Roses, you know. Gun, guns, yeah. Foo Fighters, even. Like, you know, like, it's like a mix. It's right. a driver will be driving it, you know, you back from, you know, the. I mean, obviously, you know this from playing Rock and Reel. It's like a fucking city within a city, man. It's like. It was my first show with Guns and Roses. Man. Well, I know. Oh, tell it. Was it? That was your first show? Yeah. Holy shit. Tell me about that. Uh, well. It's in the book. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to say it if you don't want. But I mean, like, that's, uh, that's wild. Well, we oh, I know. How about this? I've been in Rio before with you two, but my first day of hosting, I got food poisoning. So I was like projectile vomiting when I wasn't on camera or running to the toilet. Uh, <laughs> and I, But I, I got it together by the second day. And it was just from eating fruit in water at the hotel and just not. You always got to forget about food, the water. You know? Yeah. yeah. But I love, I love, I love rock and Rio. And I love. So there's a whole thing in here about yeah, rock and Rio because, you know, we we go there GNR 1991, right before the Illusions album come out. We go there and we do two sold out nights in Maracanã Stadium, which is about 150 thousand people, and opening that the one night was Megadeth, Sepultura, oh great, yeah, Judas Priest. We were the headliners and. We opened the set with a song they never heard before, a song called Pretty Tied Up. Yeah, Asia. great song from it. We opened this show, and that was yeah. the first time, and it's in the book, that actually we played all together. Axel didn't like to rehearse. He he was the kind of guy that could just get up and do it. And I remember just going, oh, my God, like 150,000 people. Just When we went into Jungle and like Paradise City, the ground was shaking because everyone was like, no, 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 right? Yeah. And we did the second night we did um we did two sold out nights. And I remember when we got off the airplane, we landed in the airport and uh they threw a 
uh, like a decoy to go through the front because it was like 2000 kids. I felt like I was in the Beatles, you know? Yeah. Like, and we went out the back and we got in these vans. And I remember I was sitting with Izzy Stradlin, the original guitar player. And uh, one of the, one of the, original members of the band yeah and kids were like you know climbing on the van and banging on the windows and he says you're like holy shit i'm in a hard day's night man or something you know like, calm and he says welcome to the band matt i'm like uh, yeah yeah it's so <laughs> great man yeah. you, you, was, wait are, are you ever in touch with izzy i mean he's totally you know, kind of you know, gone off the grid just doing his own thing yeah you know he's just you know he's quiet he's a quiet guy he's i think you know it's like you make your mark and he wrote so many great songs and yeah. did his own thing. And, you know, it, 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 playing music, he, I, he wants to play it the way he wants to play it, I guess. So yeah. he records songs once in a while and he'll throw them up online. And yeah, just like for right now, I mean, he's, he definitely, I mean, we well, did one weird song. I got a call from him one day. He said, Hey, come to Ojai, which is north of. Yeah. Uh, it's where Susan Silver lives, you know, like uh, Chris yeah, Cornell up towards Santa Barbara. So I get in this car. Yeah. And I, for some reason, he sent me a car. I'm like, I yeah. Know. So I didn't know where I was going because it's way in the heck out in the middle yeah. of nowhere. And I get to the studio and uh, we recorded this song in like an hour. It was called uh, Fighter Pilot Money. You can check it out online. It's, yeah, I, I got to listen to it, man. It's literally I, like two takes. It's me and Izzy. And uh, my buddy Damon Fox came up and played keyboards. Yeah. He actually works with Linda Perry a lot, who's, yeah, so he's, he's part of this this family that I'm. I'm yeah, and he plays like a double part, and he's cool done that. like. But anyway, I go, hey, you should call this friend of mine. He plays amazing B three. You should get him. So he goes, okay, cool, and and that's what I love about these old records. You hear these stories, like I was going to show you the phonograph album. Ace, are you here, honey? Hey, you know, you, I know you're going to still show me uh, Ringo and Ziggy. I think we got, we're going to do couple, Ace. All right? Can you grab I mean, me that? Can you grab me that Ringo album? Um, you know, because here's the crazy thing. I mean, that blows me away. That uh, I always loved that record. And but Stardust. Yeah. Well. I mean, yeah. Just epic. What you can never. Hey, by the way, you can never go wrong with it in your house anytime. You know, I was I was bummed out the other day, and I put on "It Ain't Easy," which is a cover. But I uh, another very unsung guy on this in this particular band lineup. Mick Ronson's one of, or are you talking about Woody Woodmanson? Yes. There you go. The drummer, it, Woody was great, right? Man. Oh, so Woody, great. Trevor, the, the Spiders to Mars band, they deserve Trevor to be in a rock. Remember, oh, the, Mick remember, Ronson. The Chubb, remember Trevor Bolden? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Man. Like beyond Lemmy, you know, they were like, yeah. Dude, those but, guys uh, are so fucking great. I mean, look man. at this album, you know, uh, Five Years, Moon Age Daydream, Starman. Suffragette City, Rock and Roll Suicide. Hang on to yourself. One of the coolest. Hang on to yourself. You me, know. And, you know, me and Steve Jones, when I when I when I did Jonesy's Shoebox, where I interviewed him and, and like he was my guest on his own show. Yeah. We opened with Hang On to Yourself at the Viper. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. So great. Yeah, you know, I mean it's I mean, that's one of those songs. And of course, Bowie cool. did it in a really weird mellow version with Arnold Corns that yeah, sounded yeah. like a slow velvet underground version, but I mean, Mick Ronson and, and, and the Spiders made, you know. Well, they, there's young Mick guitar Ronson. players. I meet young guitar players. Um, there's there's a kid uh, that I really like. Um, that's, oh, what's it? What's the name of his damn band? Anyway, you know, he's got the uh, the, the usual guys, Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page, you know. Yeah. And I go, no, 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 no. You got to check out this guy, Mick Ronson. Mick Ronson, dude. You know, Mick Taylor. There's, there's yeah. guys... Those guys that deserve the credit that they yeah. haven't gotten, right? Man, you Woody know, Woodsman Z, you know, he wrote yeah. a book. Yeah. About his time Bowie, with Bowie. Man. Have you have you seen a Mick Ronson documentary beside Bowie? No, but I will watch it. Oh, you got to watch it tonight when you're you're just chilling. It's yeah. so good because people don't realize that Mick Ronson, you know, produced Morrissey, Ma, you know, Mata Hoop, even though it was Bowie's name on it, Pure yeah. Prairie League. And came up with the riff on Jack and Diane. I mean, he's like did all this shit. And, and you know what? And there was a time when he was struggling financially. Morrissey got him out of it, and it was criminal that he was struggling financially because he was a fucking Mick Man, Ronson is like, one of my heroes. And he was—I so, met him when I was seventeen. I snuck backstage 
him and Ian Hunter from Yeah, Uncle some of those stories about Bowie I never really liked. You know, Stevie Ray Vaughan and the Last Dance album. You know, you you know those stories. But I mean, the, that's the stuff in the business that we're talking about. It's like, but I'm glad. You, yeah, but I'm glad you and I love Mick Ronson. So it's called B Side Bowie, and I'm telling you, Matt, you're gonna love it, man. It's so cool that he was gonna give up on music, and he was actually. Yeah, putting the yeah. lines on soccer fields, like rolling the the white yeah. lines on them. Right. When someone said you should go try out for this and meet this this David Bowie guy, you know, yeah. like yeah. And he changed everything. You know, and, then, and we were talking about the Iggy album, you know, and, and Bowie being involved in this. And remember, in those in those times, they were all hanging out in Berlin. Berlin was yeah. like the hub, right? And you know, being in the band with Geezer. Recently, Deadland Ritual, Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath. Yeah, tell everybody about it, man. That's such a cool band. Like, tell me about the ladder. You and Geezer started. Well, we went out and did a tour last summer. I'm not sure what's going to happen for the future, but um, uh, we made a Sabbath fans of- need to know about. It. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they know, but I, I want you to tell. But me. I was just going to talk about just music and the German connection because, yeah, you know, Iggy went to Germany and he went to a studio called Hansa. And hung out with Bowie, and they yeah. co-wrote most and of this. You did Octan Baby there, which was so right. cool. And then yeah. Iggy did China Girl with 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 Bowie for his album. A lot of that stuff was done at Hans's studio. You know, Heroes; those songs were all recorded at the same studio. Yeah, it's down in Vision, and they had Low and Heroes, and, and I think Lodger might have been recorded there too. I think so. That's right. I think they all were. It was that trilogy because Bowie had to get out of Los Angeles because it was just fucking killing him, man. Yeah, Even he, was though he, was making- look, he was always looking for pe- different uh, musicians, uh, yeah. orchestras. He was, you know, the, his documentaries, uh, the yeah. biggest part he, of his documentary. He was so good to me, man, and such a beautiful man. And, he, you know, he like, had me over his place. And sat really? playing Bowie? Music. Oh, dude, I'll tell you a story. Oh, my I met God. Bowie at a dinner through MTV one night. They put me in front of him and Iman, and I'm, Drinking Jack Jack and Cokes because I'm nervous because he's one of my heroes. By the end of the dinner, he asked me to help him with his set list for the Nine Inch Nails tour, which no one knew about yet, the songs that weren't singles. After that, I run into him a few again a few years later after 9-11. And I'm doing AR Columbia, and Tony Visconti calls me and tells me to come check out Christine Young. Oh wow, Tony down Christine. at CBGB's gallery. Yeah. Guy taps me on the shoulder. It's David Bowie. He's like, Matt, how you doing? And I just look at him, I go, you know, David, you know, I lost my apartment uh, downtown. So I, I went back to my storage and I found my diamond dog sheet music. And I go, never asked anybody to sign anything. I go, I go, but I said, I wish you, I had asked you to sign. He goes, I'll sign anything. He goes, what are you doing after this? And I go, well, I'm going back to my wife and kid me a relocation apartment on 8th and 50th. And then he goes, wow. come have dinner with me. So I get in a car with Bowie. We get in the back seat of his driver's car. We go to this restaurant in Little Italy. We go to the back patio, and then we meet Tony and Christine and Coco, Bowie's old assistant, and we have dinner. And David's like, "Man, he goes, you got to tell me your 9/11 story." So then, a few weeks, a couple weeks later, what happened was when Ken and Nancy Berry lost their gigs at EMI, so Bowie actually had me in the studio with him. Wow. Calls me. I go to Looking Glass. You know the Philip Glass studio? Yeah. After Mario and everybody works there, and Tony Gascani. And he's sitting there. He goes, he goes, Matt, he goes, I, I can't believe I just got a phone call. The Interpol, not the band, but, you know, the police organization, found all these outfits that were stolen on the stage in Portugal during the Latin Saint tour. And he's like, oh, the fucking back, man. You know, they belong to me. He was the best. So I then Mick, Mick, then Mick Rock comes in. So it's this big reunion. Great photos. And then, uh, you know, then David called me. It's in my book, but it's oh, the funniest cool, story ever. Because I love it. it. I mean, it, New York in those days was crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. And he, but he was so, he was so, oh. boy, he was so kind to me. He was one of my idols, so. Yeah. You know, I mean, for me, it's like. Well, I'm, you know, when I, you know, you know when he, Scott, got, Scott Weiland, when Scott was in the band Velvet Revolver and everything, you know. You know, that was the thing. The last thing Bowie said to me was. I know your friend Scott is struggling. He goes, if he want, if he needs to talk to somebody, I'll be there for him. And I know, wow. and you know, wow. I finally got to tell him. Yeah. When he was doing that last solo tour, and then you know he died shortly after that. You know. 
Yeah, well, he loved he loved Bowie, man. Well, but yeah, I mean, he had the know. swagger Bowie had, man. Scott. Yeah, well, he great. would come out in the white suit and the whole thing. Yeah, you know? it's like you know. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, we all love Bowie. I mean, think about it. Like, all right, when you know that was like for me, it's like uh, you work with three of the greatest frontmen to me. You worked, you know, like Axel. You know, you work with Scott. <laughs> Ian Asprey's amazing too. Oh, yeah. I love him. You know, like he's one of the greats and a great friend. And um. There's a certain guy that can do that, you know. It's that's a that's big shoes to fill when you're a front man at that level. And I always say to people, you know, they ask me questions. Oh, was he this? Was he that? And I'm like, well, he he was this and he was that, but that's what made him great. <laughs> and that's you know, when I talked to you about when we had the call after pa Scott passed away, you were the only guy I would talk to because yeah, and you know I what? Wanted people to understand, you know, to not focus on obviously the things that took him away from the planet and yeah. out into hopefully uh the afterlife and he's he's happy and peaceful now you know like, but you what know. i wanted to talk about was the art he created and the art yeah came from the demons and the demons created the art so not that every artist has to have you know this thing but in in all reality most artists have this underlying situation that brings great lyrics and brings great art and scott was just that guy and um you know all the singers i've worked with you know they're they're these really intense characters but you know they have to walk up on stage and deliver in front of hundreds of thousands of people and right and yeah and with no shield i'm i'm a drummer i'm behind all this stuff <laughs> yeah <know>? like, yeah <laughs> And guys gotta go. And I got my story. My story's in the book too. Why do you play yeah. drums, Matt? You know, it's and, and it's just, all right here. Yeah. And can I just say thank you? Because yeah. I remember that they I found out Scott died. I was flying down to see my daughter in Florida. And I had to go through the you know the Charlotte, North Carolina uh, airport. And I was I was very upset. It was the same thing. I found out about Bowie like middle of the night or four in the morning, you know. And it was but so Sirius XM called me. They're like, Matt, you know, lithium. They're like, yeah. you want to want you to life like four hours and just play Scott's stuff and yeah. talk to fans and people. And I texted you. And I remember that you were like, I didn't want, obviously, you know, my love and respect for you was like, not, I wouldn't push you. Like, you know, that's just, you don't do that. To you. You give well, everyone, everyone was calling me, you know, as soon as Scott. Yeah, and it was so you know, cool that you agreed to do that because you well, didn't. Rolling have Stone, you know, Rolling Stone, all the big rock publications were trying to get a hold of me. And, you know, I just don't want to throw out some statement. I was the only guy that actually, I think, spoke about Scott. No, the rest of the guys. You were, you were. And, you know. But I, you know, I, I, I said, well, if there anybody I can talk to that would understand would be Matt Pinfield. So when you reached out to me, I said I would do the interview and obviously it was a very emotional time yeah it and was man the emotion comes around the life that you've lived and yeah we all live different lives but when you speak all of a sudden something happens and yeah so but thank you for doing that and you know i i miss those guys i miss i miss i miss chester i used to talk to chester all the time he played with me just chester, Chris, chester I, Matt. I, I i wish he was here because he was one of the guys that i felt in my mind could stay and replace some of the other greats that have left left us. Yeah, I mean, his voice was so Chris, Chris, Cor yes, man, right? voice Chris Cornell. Chris Cornell was one of the greatest singers ever. And a beautiful and, man. I loved him. And so a great much. guy. And I toured with him. With Soundgarden came out. It's in the book. They opened for Guns. Yeah, I, Chris yeah. told me a funny story when he was on tour with Audio Save about Axel, like high fiving him every night on the stage. Well, yeah, <laughs> because me and Axel would go out and watch Chris Cornell. Yeah, so, I loved it. Yeah, like, Axel so never cool. did that shit, and Axel, yeah, but because Chris was just the shit. Well, right? he picked I mean, Axel picked a lot of bands, Nine Inch Nails, yeah, uh, Blind Melon, all those yeah. bands. Was that? Axel, Axel was really that. loved that stuff. Axel was always open minded, always Depeche Mode, everything. When he played me and like look, a whole by Nine Inch Nails. Queen or two of my favorite bands of all time. You got to remember when Nine Inch Nails came out, early nineties, yeah. right? Yeah, Axel gave me that CD first CD. Remember? Yeah, and. And I went, what? what and I put going it, on? Like, oh, yeah. black ass is And I'm like, Whoa. Is a, is a, and, he, and he went, uh, I want to have this band open. And you know, there's, there's a chapter in the book, not a whole chapter, but where they open for us and they get booed off stage. And 
um, basically everyone didn't want, you know, it was very industrial and heavy and, and maybe a little too heavy for a GNR crowd, but there's a whole story in there. But, but you, but at least it proves Axel always looked great shit. Like, you know, the story about Chris Weber, who was in Hollywood Rose with him and Chris told me the story that he actually paid, helped them pay for the Finn Lizzie black rose tattoo on his arm. And I saw Axel do an interview before anybody really had heard Appetite. And they're interviewing him on TV and, and they go, he goes, my tattoos? He goes, I wanted to meet Phil Linnett. Man, <laughs> he up and died to me. And I went, I fucking have to listen to this band right now, Guns N' Roses. Yeah, because well, my Thin Lizzy. Thin Lizzy. Yeah. You know, Nazareth. Yeah, Nazareth. Oh, my God. You Dude, know, Nazareth, by the way. You got to go deeper because people always yeah. go, Aerosmith, you know. Dude, Nazareth, man, Dan McCafferty, his voice yeah. oh is actually influential on brian johnson it's like you know what i mean like it has listen, that listen listen to nazareth and then listen to we did a version on this hair of the dog that's yeah. right now yeah. listen to both yeah nazareth hair of the dog guns and roses hair of the dog and then i i implore people and i always said this to slash i said slash are you a big michael shanker fan because go listen i to love you. ufo too so the ufo michael shanker albums you know, from like force it to fucking, you know, like obsession. Too, man. Strangers in the night. I had, a U I had a UFO club in high school. Oh, you did? Everyone yeah. was like, Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin. I was like, Led Zeppelin. I mean, it's like Britney Spears. I mean, yeah. come on. We love Zeppelin, but here's the funny thing. I Led went Zeppelin in my, don't get me wrong. I don't yeah. want that to come but out. But I know why you love UFO. Here's the thing. I don't want, I don't want some headline to say, Matt said Britney Spears and Led Zeppelin. I, yeah. But you got to remember, this is the 70s and Led Zeppelin was mainstream. Yeah. They were like, right, stairway to heaven. And then yeah. you had bands like UFO. Doing Too Hot to Handle and Doctor Doctor and Let yeah. you know Thin Lizzy. You know, Lizzie. it was like, yeah. yeah. You know, I you're saw like a kid. You're a kid in high school is trying to be cooler than the other kid, going, yeah. Hey, check out this band. Yeah, and I bring records in. And it's you know what, Matt, you'll love the story. I there was New York Palladium. I saw in one night, cheap trick in color, UFO lights out. Rush Farrell and the Kings in the same night, all three hours. Yeah, that's how they did it. Man. Remember how they did it? Like Judas Priest would be doing sin after sin. Yeah. Um, you know, it was funny because well, I, you know, I remember seeing um, you know, multiple concerts. Like I remember went to the stadium and saw Aerosmith, Jeff Beck, the Rick Derringer group. Yeah. Uh, you know, know. yeah. Remember, remember stars with I love so you know what's funny? I love it. Yeah. I love the first two stars out. So you go to a concert, it was like I was, I, I you know, festival was it? You're gonna laugh back? because how I discovered Judas Priest and Aria Speedwagon on this weird bill was, yeah. I went to see Stars because Stars I loved because I saw that the same guy who managed them managed Kiss and like, and I was like, Bill of Coin, Bill of Coin, who you know what? They asked me to speak at his funeral and I fucking uh, I couldn't Bill Coin. come across country, Casablanca well. Records, yeah, Neil Bogart, yeah, but it was like, yeah, I love uh, Stars and that shit. I mean, like I, Clive Davis. I hope Clive Davis is out there listening. Did we talk about him live? We're going to talk about, you know what? Clive was, is such a cool dude. Just tell me about your conversation. You said you talked to him, but talk about the conversation. Itself. Well, we had this great call and we were just, you know, he's like this. He's like the, us, but he's he's been doing it 10 times longer than us. Right. Yeah. So uh, he came. Yeah. You know, this guy started in the, you know, the 50s, all through the yeah. 60s. And, you know, obviously he discovered so many great artists, worked with. Yeah. Ruth, Aretha Franklin recreated her career, but yeah. uh, signed Patti Smith. You know, obviously yeah, on Arista, man. You know, like he did, like Bruce you know, Springsteen. Right? Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, yeah, him and signed Hammond. Aerosmith in the early, early days. Yeah. So Chicago Transit Authority. Uh, Chicago, Chicago, I mean, and that's by the way, those early Chicago records are fucking great. You know, man. You know, people yeah. that have, you know, I, I, I have to explain to people. But the thing that was really cool about talking to him, yeah, he, he remembered every moment of what I experienced and some. Like, he's 88 years old, just turned 88, and just the ultimate music lover, the ultimate old school record executive. Yeah. And we were, he was saying, you Matt, Matt, you remember when you went platinum and I had the, party at the hotel at the hotel Gansabor in new york city and oh the Gansabor hotel yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Like, this is 15, 16. On that roof. Like, that, that's Claude's like, like sharp as a whip. He remembers everything, man. Yeah. And he says, I think Sean Penn was there. And I went, he was? <laughs> it's like, you know, and, it's uh, and yeah. then we just talked about, you know, making those records. And he said, and he says, do you remember when I came out to the studio in Burbank? And he drove out with his posse of people that work for the label. Yeah. And he drove, Scott had a studio called Plush, which was yeah. in Burbank near the five freeway. Yeah. And it hey, was, were you involved in Snitch too? Uh, uh, no, I wasn't part of that. That was Scott. <laughs> yeah, because I, had, I had some weird crazy moments. We played there though. Remember that? Yeah, I was. I had Send Dog on recently. We talked about- We got up and did an acoustic set. Yeah, and you guys were there and slashing everybody and we were like, uh, yeah. my friend Mike Diamond, you know, and everybody was yep, running back right. there. So anyway, and, Clive uh, says, Clive says, Matt, remember when I came to Plush Studios and and uh, he hadn't heard any of the lyrics yet and he was getting ready to sign the band and um, we we played him uh, Fall to Pieces and then we played him Slither. Yeah, uh, two fucking amazing singles, We right? played another song called Got No Right and he went, he went, ooh, like, which was a great ballad on that album. Never really got as to be a single, but, um, but anyway, we just really reminisced about uh, maybe probably one of the great last points of the big business of, of selling records. Like, you know, yeah. I said, wouldn't it be crazy if someone sold 3 million records today in a rock band? He goes, yeah, wouldn't that be crazy? Cause it's like, yeah. you know, we sold 3 million records, you know, got, got these accolades, Grammys and things. And yeah. And you know, it's, uh, and it was great. I mean, that was, that was a great record. And, then he, and then, he, then he said, Hey, do you remember the party in Las Vegas? I'm like, he's like, yeah, where well, you came and it was Whitney Houston. And I remember I was walking in with my wife, Ace, we were in this Vegas big suite and the door opened and it was Whitney Houston. And I don't care who you are. We went, oh, it's Whitney. <laughs> We're like, Whitney. Gotta give her love. I gotta give her respect, man. Love. Oh, you know? She was, was so insane. And she's, by the way, the niece of Dionne Warwick, who's also was a fucking incredible singer. Bacharach and so David, like anyway, all that shit. So great. I mean, I love, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of like we everything. Were talking about you know all I mean? that. We were talking about all that stuff. And it was just, yeah, it was great for him and it was great for me. And that's like you and me when we talk. We just love it. We've, we've been able to do it and um, you know, what a great life. And I uh, just hope we can get back to it soon. Yeah. You know, yeah, man, it's, you know, it's crazy. You know, it's just, um, let me tell you, like, you've always been there as a brother to me and a, a friend and we, we get each, you know, first of all, we're like the biggest music fans together. And you know, I'm a, I was, a, I'm a fan of your, of yours first and foremost and a friend. You also got me through some really rough shit, you know, like, as, as we do, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's our thing. But at the same time, this is getting me through, and I hope it's getting other musicians and music fans through, hearing our stories and the stuff we're talking about, you know? And that's why I love that Linda Perry and Carrie I hope we're not boring. I hope we're not boring them to death. I don't think we're boring. <laughs> if, you're a, if you are an actual music fan and you yeah. want to know, I mean, Matt, your life is, is not boring. And neither <laughs> is mine. You know what I mean? Like, and you also, I mean, Think about it. All the great bands you played with, and yeah, and you, well, and you, and you keep doing, and you keep playing, creating new stuff, and doing what you do, and you always bring positivity to everything you do, which I love so much, man. Like when I, you know what I mean? I, and I think we have that in common. We, we, you know, we just want to bring positive spirit and soul to people because yeah, well, you know, we've had some interesting twists and turns, and like I said, we're, we're the lucky ones in this situation, you know? Yeah. My life, I've never known where I'm going next. It's always been like that for me. Yeah. Just, my one thing that I have now more than ever is faith and hope that, yeah, you know, it always works out. And I, you know, not to sound trivial or whatever that everyone's saying that people are really struggling and I don't care. Yeah. I know the feeling of having financial struggles because I had them oh. early in my career and yeah memory not being able to even know when I was going to eat next. So I know what that feels like. I've been there. I didn't, you mean, what, I wasn't born, you know. with, I wasn't born into, a, I came from the suburbs of Orange County. I came to Hollywood with 40 bucks. So I know that feeling and that's a horrible feeling. And it is. And you know, it's, it's, it's wild, really you know. hard. It's really hard to fight the fear of that anxiety that you yeah. feel when you don't know where your next meal's coming. Number one, how are you going to pay your rent? all that kind of stuff. So what I got to say to people, and I'll say it really simple. It's, it's all about 
you got to just be in faith. You know, whatever, if you don't believe in God, just believe that it, you're going to be taken care of. I, believe, I in faith, believe in spiritual. I personally b believe in God because you know what? So do I. You know it, that. It, it, my opinion is he, he's had my back my whole life. Guaranteed. And if I'd be long gone, if I didn't. Yeah, oh, I, dude, this I should have been dead 20 times. I'm sure. I don't know about you, but you yeah. know. And he, the phone will ring. And my life is like that. The phone will ring and it'll be like Billy Gibbons going, hey, man, it's Billy. Let's go on the road. And I'm like, I look at that like, and I said this at Lemmy's funeral when I played with Motorhead. I was going through a really tough spot. Velvet Revolver had broken up, right? Yeah. And I didn't know what I was going to do next. I said, I haven't got another band in me. I had the cult, Guns N' Roses, Velvet Revolver. I said, can I do this again? Now I'm 45, 60, 50 years old almost at that time. And I'm like, man, I don't know. Can I pull it off? And I was, you know, I was getting, there was, there was some depressions setting in and that's, it's all in here. <laughs> and basically oh, the, phone, you know? the phone rang and it was Lemmy. Yeah. And I've said this and I said it at Lemmy's funeral. I said, Lemmy is God. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful he guy. Brought me, man. He brought me this sense of like faith that I never really felt before because I didn't know if I could do it. And I went out in the road with Motorhead for a short time, only a month. I grew a beard. And I got, my wife hated it. I, <laughs> I hated it. Right? My hair was all scraggly. And I was like, ah. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to I get ate it. the space and fucking, we are the road crew. I wore, right? yeah, I, I wore a Killed by beard. death, all the greats, right? Yeah. But, yeah. And, I, you know, I didn't want to get killed by Motorhead fans because I'm so honored that I was even allowed to be up there. And what I said was, look, after that, it's all, it's all, uh, apples and oranges man it's all icing on the cake i mean you know for me i've had this incredible journey and i just got to go like well i'm being taken care of man and i feel like for my story that's my story but for other people to have that faith is that you're going to get to the next level you're going to get through you're going to yeah you know, something's going to come that's you're going to be like what i didn't you know we've all been there yeah we have man you know the relationships you know love uh where you're at in your life what's your next job you know so i i'm just such a strong believer because i've seen it and i felt it yeah me and, too uh, man you know like it's 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 interesting how things come around and i always think that you know guys like you and i like we always we also want to pay we pay it forward and, and help others be of service always you know like and you know it's been it's been a rough you know month or two because you know like you know my everybody in my family lost their jobs um so, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm taking care of everyone, you know what I mean? And, uh, but you know what? They're the people, I, they're the people I love more than anything. And you know what? When things turn, they will get rehired to get work again. I mean, things will change for them. Yeah. But you know what? And, and yeah, that's a lot of stress on, on a person. I, I won't deny. At the same time, I love them so much that it is a very spiritual thing from the heart that, you know, well, yeah, you know what, yeah. and it, I think now we're more, you know, for people that are having struggles out there, you know, connecting is so important. And it's not like, okay, let's say you're isolating, right, or whatever. And now we've got all this technology, and here we are talking to each other. And you and I, like, and getting, you know, all oh, like, like always getting through, you know, supporting each other. And, and I, you, you know, and I like, thought about that. I thought about people that are hanging out with, with like, you know, our brothers. I've called a few friends of mine that I know are completely alone in the house. Like uh, I was talking to, you know, guitar player named Ricky Medlock. Oh, you know, I love Ricky. Oh, and dude. A band called Leonard Skinner. And I, I'm talking dude, Rick, to Ricky is one of the nicest guys in Blackfoot, man. Well, I'm he, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's common knowledge in Ricky. I apologize, apologize if it's not, but he has one lung. And, and he's one of the sweetest guys in the world, man. Well, the thing about the one lung is he's- Ross and he's and Johnny you know? He's locked in the house right now by himself because he's at such a high risk. So as a friend and people, other friends, to be able to call and say, hey, how you doing? You're all by yourself, right? Dude, you he, know can't what? Have, he can't have other people around him at all right now. So I'm saying to people out there, think about people like that. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, and my mom's by herself. She's 87. Me, you know, like, well, there's other so people that might not have the power to pick up the phone, right? They don't man, have you, it's you know, thousand, I call it the thousand pound phone. It's like, oh, yeah, 
Because it is. Because some people don't want it. Like, they feel like when they need to reach out for support. I'm looking for Ricky's number in my phone right now. Because, dude, I'm going to call him if... Uh, yeah. 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 Call yeah. Him, I, tell I, him that someone said, hey, I have one long. And he'll be like, no dude, one knows you know, that. He, let me tell you, those guys, man, he and, you know, Johnny and Donnie, you know, I never knew, I, I was too young to meet yeah. Ronnie Van Zandt, but Gary and all the other dudes and, yeah, and, you know, yeah. I was there at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when they got inducted and they were, they were going, hey, is it cool we take pictures with you for our kids? I'm like, dude, I should be asking you guys to take pictures. But yeah. I had to, even Artemis Pyle, I heard, you know he goes, me. You play the show with in Vegas? I did a gig with uh, Billy Gibbons and yeah. The band opening was the Artemis Pyle band. How were they? What were they doing? What, what songs were they doing? They were doing Skinner. And Artemis Pyle is not the original, original drummer. Yeah. No, I know he was. He was the drummer during the height of their career. Yeah, man. You know what else was cool? Ed King, man. You know, the guy who wrote the riff, the intro for Sweet Home Alabama and like yeah. playing on the first two albums. But it's his relationship was always weird because, hey, look. My daughter was born in Jacksonville. I'm, I'm very involved in the Jacksonville music scene. I love that. I got so much family down there. But it's really interesting that I never thought about it till later that some when Ed left the band, yeah. if you look at the pronounced Leonard Skinner album, he's standing by himself, even though there's such a part of it. But, I mean, he was involved in the first three albums, like Second Helping, you know, Nothing Fancy, all that stuff. He's a well, I, I see. I was. I so, love the police. Now we're talking Southern rock to seventies. Yeah, my buddy, I love it. You know, I have a buddy, Daryl Brooks, who's yeah. my best man at my wedding. Yeah, he was only into Southern rock. I was in UFO. Yeah. Stuff. He yeah. Well, me. I had I had a problem with people that were just into Southern rock because I liked fucking everything. Well, like, he liked the outlaws. The police, he you know, liked right? the outlaws. He liked Thirty Eight Special. Which little, I love, but you know what I mean. But the, I was the like, Allman Brothers. Yeah. Who I love too. Whipping Post, one of the greatest songs ever written. We went to the Hollywood Palladium in 1975 and we saw the original lineup of Leonard Skinner. Skinner oh, man. Outlaws, Greengrass, and High Tides. For Which is years. such a great song. Fucking, you know, whether yeah, it's the uh, 11 minute studio version or the 15 minute live, bring them back a live version. But I was into it. I said, you know what? This, they, they were a rebel rock and roll band. That's all. They were. Well, you know what? Skinner never, ever wanted to be called a Southern rock band. They, they said, we're just a rock and roll band, which was yeah. the interesting thing that Peter Rudge, who was the road manager for Zeppelin and The Who, decided to manage them. And yeah. Townsend took a liking to them. You know what I mean? Which was That's so right. fucking cool. Right. The Let's story. Talk, you want to talk about Ringo's record? I found oh, it. Fuck yeah, I do. It'll be our, it'll be our, yeah, because we'll my computer's a low battery. I don't know why the fuck it isn't plugged in. Here we go. But anyway, you know what? R that first Ringo record, is so brilliant. The only pro the only thing that's missing is it don't come easy. One of the greatest singles ever. Right. Well, yeah. but the first single from any Beatle to enter the charts, top 10, was Photograph. That's right. And who was that co-written by? George Harrison. You're so good. You're yeah. so good. But, yeah. So now and remember, remember, every Beatle was on this album. Yeah. Not together on one song. And why was the were they not together? Paul McCartney we'll got around that time, or something happened with Paul. Paul right? McCartney got arrested for marijuana. He he, uh, they were going to play Japan, I believe, and they got busted on the border. So so Paul couldn't leave the UK. So Ringo had come to to Los Angeles and joined a party club called the Hollywood the Hollywood Band. Vampires. That's right, yeah. with Alice Cooper. Yeah, Gary Nielsen, one of the Pete greatest. Moon, John Lennon for Lost Weekend. People like to pretend he was always there, but he wasn't. He was only there in the May right. period, right? When Yoko kicked him out of the house. He came out to visit Ringo and Harry Nielsen, yeah, and all of his buddies, and they got him drunk for the Lost Weekend. And yeah, basically, this album was done when Ringo came to L.A. And if you look at the, the Richard Perry produced it, right? Richard Perry, yeah, and and Klaus Vormann, who did all the artwork. And did the artwork on Revolver, which that's he right. Both made, right? right here. You know, that's a great first record. And even John's, like, to, like his fuck around, yeah. I'm the greatest, was so cool. Like, there was, it was yeah. just, Well, that was John so Lennon's song. And you know what I said to Ringo one time? I said, you know, I said, I said, Ringo, you know, you're the best. And he said, no, you're the best. I'm the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how isn't he the 
what a lovely man, you yeah, know. And so, so look at this. I love him so much. This, this, is, all Klaus, yeah, this is Klaus Vorman, who played bass with George Harrison, and you know, great. Bass and he knew him from Berlin, right? Like yeah. or Hamburg, Hamburg. That's where. Right. Yeah. Because the Beatles, like I was going to say earlier, came up in Hamburg, and so did Black Sabbath. Yeah. This is all Klaus At Norman. Earth, right. So this is inside the vinyl, right? Really cool. And and then look when you look at the album, you know, you're like, whoa, there's Paul McCartney and Linda played on six o'clock on the back, right? Yeah. And the arrangements. And then you got like Tom Scott doing horns. And of course, Billy Preston, who played yeah. with the Stones. And yeah, Billy great. Preston was great, man. I mean, you know, he was so surprised when the Beatles gave him credit. I like your back. Well, here's Mark yeah. Bolin and Have You Seen My Baby, Mark Bolin. And yeah. a lot of people don't know this, but Ringo shot that album cover for T-Rex. You know that, right? Yeah, yeah for a slider. And you know, one of the first conversations I ever had with Ringo was about Mark because I was a huge T-Rex fan. Yeah. And we, yeah. uh, and this was years before, we're, now we know each other. So now we're like, you know, we have, you know, we have a continuing dialogue and we, and we get along great. And I love him. I love him so much. And he's been very, very Leave on Helm. The band, was, is, on, oh, the band on. is on this record. Oh, dude, it's great. But I want to just tell you that, like, he said to me, when I talked about Mark Bowen the first time, he said, yeah, man, he goes, you know, I loved him. He goes, took him too, way too, way too early for us, you know, because of yeah. the car crash. But he also told me the funny story not that long ago when you and I and him were like all in the same place. And he goes, the, he goes, yeah, you know, because he, he always, Ringo always like, likes to look at my rock t-shirts and like say something about him. He always checks what I'm wearing, which is funny. And he goes, <laughs> look, I was that. I had an Allison Chain shirt on. He goes, hey, you don't change any, any anymore, man. You're with us. Yeah, <laughs> He's yeah. just like, you know, yeah. guy. But, but the T-Rex t-shirt, the second time I wore it, he goes, he goes, you know, it was funny. He goes, we were like 30. <laughs> he goes, Mark Bowen's coming and going, I'm going in straight at number one. And like, he goes, we're all sitting around going, we're the fucking old guys at 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, it was just funny. Yeah. You know, it, it was just like, you know, that like, he's just such a, uh, such a beautiful, beautiful man. That record is great. That first record photograph to me is just, there's something beautiful about the production. Too. Well, it's, it's just cool. You know, for me, it, for me, it means a lot because here's a drummer, you know, we've, we've, you know, he, We've had private conversations about being the drummer in big bands, <laughs> yeah, but right. obviously the Beatles is a little bit bigger. Than yeah, the you know, ever, it, it, but um, but you know, when that band broke up, I'm sure there was like any other human. What are you going to do next? Right? Like, what am I? Yeah, gonna do? I was. So he started doing his own music, and he's been playing music ever since. He's got Ringo Starr's All Stars, and he tours. And from We're that, I started with you know, all his friends, you know, and yeah. right, and like he I loved said, the rap. I said, if Ringo could do that, I could do that. So I started a band called yeah. King of Chaos. And I do kind of a more hard rock version. I bring all my friends out to play. Yeah, it's, it, it should be, right? You know? Yeah. But as a drummer, it, I mean, as a drummer, you know, what are you going to, you know? But, you know, Ringo sings on all this. This is all his vocals. And Yeah, and, and you know what? How He sang on things that were at naturally and fucking... Honey, don't all those great Soul songs. Submarine, Octopus. You know, yeah, and you know, you know, it's amazing. I um, I never, I, I never want to like say anything about the Beatles. So I don't, I don't want to be that, be that guy. But we had a conversation when we were talking about Zach Starkey, his son, and then I taught. I, I wanted to say to him. I finally said to him, I go, you know, I, I always thought it was so fucking creative and unique, the way that you would create these, like the skip beat and ticket to ride. And he goes, yeah. He goes, you know. Because we, it was we were just fucking, you know, we we were just going along creating, and I mean, think about what that is. Like, he's well, so they, if you watch the documentary, have you seen Eight Days a Week? Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. So they would go in every week, every day, and have to come up, you know, to record a song. Yeah. You know, there's George Martin and everything in there in the at, you know Abbey Road Studios, and they're basically knocking out a song a day, and they just became so proficient at it. Yeah. And everyone, you know, was chucking and jiving, obviously. You know, Paul could play drums. It's when you work in a collaborative effort like that, it's great when you have the band. Someone could say, you know, hey Ringo, just play the floor tom. Or, you know, it's okay if you can communicate like that. Yeah. That's, that's the kind of stuff that I would do when I was in the band with, with Slash and Duff. We would go like, Hey man, what about you know, cut that bridge and 
Matt, go to, you know, go to the ride somewhere. And we just throw and stuff at each other. Yeah. Having a really open mind about how we were going to create this piece of music together as a collective. Yeah. But um, you know, and, and I've, got, I've got I've got incredible collection. This is all remastered. The white uh, the white album. The I white mean, album. I'm crazy. I got stuff. I got remastered Abbey Road. Yeah. Oh, right, you know what, man? I love I love it. You know, Ringo said about um, you know, right when he does the drum thing at the end, he goes, "Well, you know, I needed a beat, so I, I used the thing from uh, Inagata De Vita, like the breakdown for like that." Yeah. But you know what? He's allowed to borrow from anybody because he created some of the greatest drumming ever. I don't care who I don't care who you are as a drummer. We all we all look. To yeah, we're gonna borrow from somebody because that's like we borrow from our, our heart and our soul and our influences, man. Whatever well, we feel. Yeah, any the- drummer for me in my book, it talks about when I see when I saw the Beatles. Now I was very young, but the Beatles played on the Ed Sullivan Show three times, and I saw when I was about five. They came out in '65. They were on 60, 64, 65. So I was. No, I mean they were like the Bah, like Florida or the Bahamas or, or something like that. When they did help, like help. Stuff. No, it's uh, "Let Me Do" when they did "Let Me oh, Do." Oh, yeah. yeah, and then um, so that was it for me. My brother got me the single "Hard Day's Night," and I had the you know forty-five with the hole in it. So that's, that's in the book. When I when I that was it. That was the visual for any kid in America. That that was the way rock and roll. And then of course. Came the Stones and everything else, and then yeah. I love them too, man. I love all those. But, the British but, uh, Invasion is fucking great, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, we could talk all day. We could be. No, I, and I know you got twenty four hours. Listen, of- you know, it's funny. We're almost on a two hour, but we, um, <laughs> you know, tell me about. I mean, before we go, Matt. You, so you got to put off. I mean, obviously a lot of stuff, and and we're you and I are used to seeing each other at least once a month. I mean. You know, I'm saying that, like, you know, depending on the beer on the road, maybe twice a month, you know. And the amazing thing for me is, like, man, when we're just, when we're hanging, like, you, me, fucking, you know, Ringo, Kenny Wayne, Shepard, like, oh, our our friend, like, this guy's hanging out. We're just musicians. I'm not a musician. I mean, look, I'm not a musician. I've sang in bands, but, you know, I knew I was a messenger. I never, like, you know, I mean, and I never had, I never had any hair. So it would have made it, it was way before. The uh, actual uh, I'm just should joking. have been in that band spirit. Remember that? Yeah, like, man. Yeah, <laughs> I got a line on you. That was fucking <laughs> great, right? But um, no. But the truth is, I miss all of like you and me and, and like the guys who hang out and get together, mm. the musicians, the brothers. Like we just fucking yeah. hang out in L.A. You know, like uh, you know we yeah, it's gonna we be go a out, weird. We got a meal. We just go out and talk. You know what I mean? Well, like, you know, when are we gonna be able to do that again? I don't know. Yeah, but, you, you know, know what? In the meantime, we just let's do this and yeah, you know the new yeah. the new I mean, reality. Right we now. have to, man. You know, <laughs> but God. when we get to break bread again, yeah, I'm not shaking your hand or hugging you. <laughs> <laughs> you you know, it's funny. I think the, the hug thing is probably going to be like out for a while. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Hand. I I don't think you and I ever hugged anyway. It wasn't really our thing, but we've been yeah, we were brothers. Nervous. I, I like to hug. We weren't hug, you know. We didn't. You weren't huggers, but we were. But we were fucking brothers all the way through. Yeah, yeah we were the hug. We were the hug guys. You're right. You're actually. You just put that in total perspective. That's not you. <laughs> we put the whole thing. But yeah, I just miss you, dude. It's more like you know, yeah. just hanging out with our, with our friends. At the same time, we have to like stay strong for our friends, our family. We're doing yeah. the show for Music Cares, and they have been so good. You know, oh, so many helped a lot of friends of mine, man. Yeah, and man. Like, you know, like, Howard, oh, everybody man. over there, man. Oh, yeah. Winnie, Shireen, like I love those yeah. guys so much. There's yeah. so much history with me and them. So and Linda, but Linda I Perry, I want to give a shout out to Linda Perry. Thank you, Linda. Isn't Linda the, and Carrie? Oh, she's, she's such a giver. She's a giver, her, man. man. And, and you uh, know, and, and Chris Rivero who books the show, and Nate yeah. and Thank Aaron. Oh, and, by the way, Chris reminded me that I did a record with. Uh, Sheree Curry, that's coming out April twenty. Dude, talk really? Dude. Yeah, huh. it's it's coming out on Blackheart Records, Joan Jett's label, and it, actually we made the record a long time ago. Go online, check it out. Uh, Rolling Stone released uh, a a cover of a Runaway song called Queens and Noise, and it's the co vocal is Brody Dahl from uh, the Distillers. Yeah, yeah, and I know Brody very well because you know, like, um, she, you know, her, she's in my book when she was still man- married to Tim Armstrong. Yeah, oh. I produced the record, and uh, you produced it, man. I produced the record at my studio in LA, and then so how many uh, is it a whole album or is it it's a whole new- record? Yeah, it's a whole record. So I was just gonna say, 
um, we were just talking about, because I remember when Linda was producing Billy Corgan, but Billy Corgan came over. There's a great track on the song, on the album called Boulevards, Boulevards of Splendor. It's Billy Corgan and Cherie Curry together. She and Cher's one of the coolest people ever. Josh Duffer on the album. Josh and Duffer on too, dude. Yeah, and and uh, the Veronicas from Australia. Yeah. Juliette Lewis sang on a track. Yeah, um, really cool record. And it finally is yeah. making the light of day. Comes out April twenty eighth on Blackheart, which is Joan Jett's label. With my, with my uh, and Joan and Kenny Laguna, you know, they're I love them. You know, so I, check you know, it out. I'm and, doing yeah. a bunch of press for it this week. My book is probably, my book is probably going to be late summer. Dude, but your book is going to blow people's fucking minds because I we didn't even touch on some of the other stories. Yeah, we've been we've done it before, but um, you know, and it's funny, you know, Cherry and uh, her sister Marie is married to um, or, or is, is Steve Lukather's, you know, married Steve Lukather from what was Dakota. they were married was yeah. married, yeah. and they Trevor were- is her son um who plays great guitar, you know, yeah. like he's got his own Trevor. Band. Yeah. And, and Luke Luther's the coolest dude because, you know, uh, I love it. He told me the, uh, the story about he and uh, Marie Curie Cherry's uh, sister was that on the first date, he took her to see a John Waters movie. <laughs> He's like, to test. <laughs> you know, this is yeah, right. yeah. a great yeah. story, man. You know? Yeah. Anyway. Hey, hey, Matt, thanks for doing this. You know? Like, I, like I love it. I Any literally, time? one hour, it, it turned into two. The truth is, you and I could probably talk about a thousand records and a thousand. There, we've got so many stories, but I really appreciate you doing this. Well, for I hope we got there. some people listening and watching, and yeah, and you know, and those who haven't seen it yet, or if they're in another territory, it's going to live online at YouTube oh. slash We Are Here H E A R. Okay, so I'll, I'll post that stuff. Yeah, please post that because this thing, <laughs> uh, this was, this was. This was seriously really, really important. And, and it was, Matt show, I'm telling you, man. Dude, the two mats. Remember, we, you and I have been talking about how many years have we been talking about that? Like <laughs> eight, ten? I don't know, man. The but, two you know, mats. Two, maybe. Yeah. The two <laughs> mats should do it. You know what? That's that's the next concept you and I come up with when we can actually be in the same room. We can or start maybe now. We're here. Maybe we can do it while we're here. I love you, know? you, brother. Yeah, I love you too, Matt. Manion, thank you so much. Thank you. For everything. For the music, your friendship, your support of the other musicians, all the people out there that are, are going through what they're going through right now, man. And, you know, there's nothing more important than, like, putting on a fucking record that you love just to get you, like, yeah. to the other side. You That's know? right, man. Music will, music will save the world. It always has. Always has. It certainly has. Thanks, so thanks man. Matt, for doing this, man. And, you know, guys, thanks for keeping us on so long. Um, <laughs> you know, luckily today, we didn't, we didn't have somebody coming on after us. So I'm like so glad we didn't have to cut it at five. It's called In a Lonely Place with Matt Pinfield. Because I live alone. I mean, you know, I, uh, my girlfriend, I, I broke up my girlfriend like a year ago. So anyway, but it's the name of a smithereen song and a... Uh, Humphrey Bogart movie. And I thought it was really cool. Um, and I grew up with those. I mean, I know those guys from Jersey. So that's why I named the uh, show that. I thought it was like, I'm in a lonely place without you. It's pretty cool. So that's why we called it that. My friend Cliff Galbraith designed the graphic. It looks like fucking Man with a Golden Arm. You know, like yeah. Sinatra or, you know, The Saint or The yeah. Prisoner, something super cool. And we're doing it, you know. So, Matt, thanks for taking the time. To do it, all right. Love Much you, brother. love to you, my brother. And Peace you know what? Everybody, as Ringo would say, "Peace and love." Yeah, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it, Matt. I love you. Thanks for taking the time, and stay safe and healthy, my brother. You too, all man. Right. Everybody out there, God bless.